Hyvää huomenta. Good förmiddag. Good morning. I will start by giving the floor in Oslo to our managing director for Hanna Holmen, Gunvar Kronman, who is waiting to give her first words to you in order to start the event of today. Gunvar, please, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody, and uh, greetings from a very snowy Oslo, where I'm today due to some cooperation uh, we have with uh, our Nordic foundations, uh, also with Norway. Uh, really warmly welcome to uh, the annual Nordic Democracy Day. Today's program is uh, really important both for us and for uh, citizens of uh, the Nordic countries. Uh, we here at, at Hanna Holmen have been focusing on media, democracy and freedom of speech for now over a decade already. And the Nordic Democracy Day is an essential part of uh, this uh, work. Hanna Holmen, uh, as an actor, has as you hopefully know, only one agenda. And that agenda is to increase, to develop, to initiate cooperation between uh, Finland and Sweden. And this allows us to work with so many important subjects like democracy, uh, Nordic cooperation in general, the coordinating efforts in the fields of crisis management that has been a very big topic for the past three years at Hanna Holmen, cultural policies uh, and climate change mitigation and much, much more. Media and democracy are intimately uh, linked together. During uh, the past few years, we've seen a rapid change in this field. The fragmentation of the media landscape has made the role of independent and professional journalists more and more vital for peace and democracy. My personal view is that there is an increasing focus on only one current news story at the time. This Shortening attention span seems to limit our ability to keep the bigger picture in sight. And the consequences of this is that we start to forget what we yesterday knew was important. This is dangerous. And also, journalism is becoming more and more dangerous, not only due to the polarization uh, in our societies that also affects the work of journalism, uh, but also very concretely uh, in an increasingly insecure uh, world. My thoughts today go to those more than now 60 journalists killed in Gaza uh, in only 55 days. Today's program has focus on the essentials, which I'm proud of. And distinguished speakers, thank you so much for coming to Hannah Holman to share your knowledge. We have a fantastic list of speakers today. In order to facilitate access to the presentations of today, we've done this time the choice to also stream the event on our YouTube channel. And that's also the main reason why we use English language today. I wish to express my gratitude to the Anders Studenius Foundation and the Finnish Innovation Fund Citra and to all our other partners mentioned in the program. This cooperation network is really vital and important for us uh, to keep doing this work. So thank you so much. I wish you all a very fruitful seminar. I will follow the seminar from Oslo uh, through the stream. Uh, tervetuloa, welcome, and have a really good and important discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Gunvor. Uh, I can tell you we have as much snow here in Helsinki right now in the region. Uh, we will start the program by uh, looking at some current news, and I will give the floor to Anne Leppejärvi of the uh, International Press Institute, and I hope you don't have only bad news. Well, I have one good, <laughs> but uh, you have to wait for it for a while and listen to me. So, uh, hello, everybody. Huomenta. Good, uh, good morning. Kumoron. Uh, I feel really honored to be the, the first standing here um, and find the clicker. <laughs> so.
So um, I have been asked newsflash. So that is something I am trying to give you. And uh, just a couple of words of myself. So uh, as um, mentioned, I am working, uh, not working, but kind of working for International Press Institute. I'm a chair of a Finnish committee. And then uh, also I work in Haagahelia, University of Applied Sciences, and a degree director in, in journalism program. Uh, two weeks ago I was in Vaso in Poland um, for both of these, these works of mine, and I met Belarusian uh, journalists and activists uh, who are exiling, in exile in Vaso. And um, I think it was the most uh, difficult uh, speaking engagement of this year um, there. And at the same time, it also meant me, to me that this event here is even more meaningful to me. We can gather here, everybody, together and celebrate democracy. And uh, we can also uh, gather together to consider how we uh, deal with some risks that it really uh, are, are a kind of bigger than I think never before in my lifetime. So, first, I would like to start with this. <laughs> this is something I uh, start very proudly, um, uh, maybe every country I visit, because I'm really proud that we have this, um, this uh, press freedom uh, law, uh, which is the oldest in the world. But what I also want to emphasize for people and also in Belarusian journalists, I, would, I wanted to also give hope that uh, it's, it's about individuals. Here we see Anders Tudenius, who was uh, from Kokkola, so Finnish <laughs> person, and Swedish, of course, at the same time. So um, that it, it's about people, and uh, I, I think that in, also in this room there is many Anders that uh, are fighting for, for the press freedom now. It's ongoing process. And uh, what the other reason I would like to show this map is that you will easily find these countries also from this map, either the same color. <laughs> and, and this map is getting more red every year. So um, also uh, if my, uh, when my title is to say what is, uh, what is happening in Nordic countries and what is happening in Europe, this is one way to say <laughs> what is happening. So also uh, Western Europe is now quite yellow and we'll see how it looks uh, next year. So um, these megatrends that Citra uh, uh, every year uh, presents, there has been already several years the battle for democracy. That is really mega trend in, in, in everywhere. But also other trends are something that are really um, interdependent. So they are global and they are interdependent and, and we are not uh, immune for those, uh, those trends uh, in Nordic countries even. And these guys uh, have a different kind of plans for us. So uh, they are fighting for, the, they are the other, other side to, th to this room, I think. And the first thing they would like to do is to take the press freedom and then really everything will, will collapse after that. We have seen it in, in many countries, also in Europe. And uh, when that is done, uh, the next move is to fill the gap uh, with really different kind of information than when it comes to journalism. So disinformation, million, billions and billions are used to spread disinformation. Uh, and it's global and uh, um, it really is an information war. Uh, and at the same time, media houses are struggling to find new ways to, to um, new business models. And uh, fact-based information is something that costs and disinformation is free. So this is a really, really um, big problem. And then we have AI. So uh, Slovakia had its, its elections in September. And uh, I think that there has been also before things happening, but this was really a big, big news that we really saw that uh, this disinformation um, is also spread uh, using cleverly AI and using people's trust against uh, um, themselves. 
Okay, so this is also the reason that I'm quite often speaking abroad, because they want to know how we did this, and you know how <laughs> it is not so so easy question. But of course, this is in, in, in this event, it's nice to show this because we are there. Uh, Nordic countries are really, really uh, in the winners in media literacy index. This is made by Open Society Institute. And when they uh, do this index, these are the things they measure. And uh, you might guess why I have <laughs> made the red this media freedom. Um, it's a big part of media literacy, that there is media. There is different kind of media outlets and there are diversity in media. Of course, an education, trust, e-participation also. But these all things are something that uh, have, have been really, really built. It has taken some time to build them. Um, it's, uh, also, Finland has started from like scratch. <laughs> and we have started to, to build education. Then, of course, the education leads to um, people that want to uh, vote and uh, also people who want to vote uh, for values, democratic values, which I always like to think when I'm paying my taxes <laughs> that this is for something bigger. So I, I want to give my, my money for, for the society to, to make us all free. Um, and this has been the progress that has been really happening in my own lifetime. This is the sauna. My father was born. It's in Savukoski, Finnish Lapland. We can, you can look at that and I will take some water. <laughs> so it was something like eight, uh, 90 years ago when he was um, born there. And this is where my son was born. So in a way, we can really see that things can develop quite, quite fast. And um, so there is hope. And now we are there, what we are, but we were also something else before. So we can talk about Nordic media welfare state, not only a uh, welfare state, but a uh, media welfare state. And it's really called Nordic maybe m many times because it only exists here. So you can see that what are the, the factors that make us that, and th that these are also the things we need to protect if we want to keep it like that. And it can be really a rabbit uh, how it will be destroyed. This is the Hungary situation. Uh, there's 13 years, and this is the same index you saw in the map. So um, how they have uh, really, um, really gone down on the index of uh, press freedom. Now there is a, a bit of good news because you can see there <laughs> there is, but this was not the one I want to tell you, <laughs> teacher. <laughs> But you can see how, how rapid it can be. Th 13 years of Fides, um, and then uh, this is the result. Uh, but then again, we have to be really careful to uh, not to be too happy to ourselves. This is from um, this September, where Journalist Liitto, the Association of Finnish Journalists, made, uh, made a survey, and uh, the result was that journalist access to information has become more difficult also in Finland after the elections. Uh, so this is something really we need to take, take uh, um, be alerted of this and make sure that um, this uh, development won't, uh, won't uh, continue. And of course we have to really understand what, mean, what it means that uh, Helsingin Sanoma journalists uh, have been uh, have had um, said that it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous um, re precedent of this um, conviction. So it's not something really normal happening in uh, in democracy that somebody who is doing uh, his or her, her work uh, needs to be afraid um, this kind of thing. So IPI is really worried about Finnish uh, development now. I see the democratic work like a line, and the line seems to steepen every <laughs> every year. So you need to really do much more effort to keep to be there where you are, uh, not to slide back. And uh, this is something w what is happening, I think, in Europe: um, rise of hybrid uh, democracies. So we have, for example, Hungary, um, that there is 
free media. There is really re free media. There are independent journalists. Uh, and for example, Harvey Gay, which is the biggest uh, magazine there, is free. And uh, every, every week it has a cover where um, the idea is that they are trying to tell about the society in a sarcastic, uh, maybe even funny ways, which I think it's also really important when you fight against this disinformation that we, we need to have also share uh, these things, not only be a sor uh, with sorrow or angry, but also make it, uh, let make it look also not funny, but uh, to share the em emotions of uh, uh, laugh, laughter and uh, joy. But they are free. But what I mean by hybrid democracies is that there are so many other levels of the society that are not free. And then they are using Harvege, for example, um, in EU, EU and saying that, here you see, we have free media. They, 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 they can always uh, use Orban on their cover and nothing happens. So it's really a paradoxical situation that you at the same time do it and you are used. So uh, trust, I wanted to uh, also uh, emphasize trust. This is something that uh, is mo maybe the most vulnerable thing, uh, and that is something we really need to protect in Nordic countries. Uh, it is really on the playbook of these authoritarian leaders that they, they attack the trust between people. They want to divide people. They want to divide them also from media and from, from, uh, from uh, uh, journalism. So they kind of come uh, between audiences and journalism. So, my idea is what, what needs to be done in Nordic countries. Um, we need to really strengthen the trust. And I think it happens uh, in our case when we are really talking about these things. And we have the sa same situational awareness of, of things. So we have to understand that we are all individually targeted every day with information, with disinformation. And also really easily we can our, ourselves um, share it. And we need to protect our own data better than we are doing now, because then if we do that, we are not that targeted. Uh, so Finnish society, and I mean, I think Nordic societies, media education really based on the individual autonomy. So we need to be strong individuals uh, when it comes to media literacy and uh, take responsibility of our own media, media behavior. And then when we are also members of society, it means that we are strong together. But we cannot kind of leave the field for others that somebody else is doing this. Uh, third thing, representation balance at the different platforms. This is something I think in Nordic countries we need to really think. And uh, maybe also journalists, but every every other institutions also. Uh, when I see saw this um, news uh, one year ago, even too, uh, that TikTok was the really main reason that uh, that Philippines uh, voted again the, the drug, drug, drug terror, um, dictatorship um, family to uh, rule them. So it was really amazing. I couldn't even even think that one year later, that not the same thing, not the same thing happened in Finland. But what I'm what I'm trying to say is that we had a one platform was where only one party was active. Only one. True Finns were there active and uh, other parties were sleeping. So I'm trying to say that we need to have the debate, but we need to have all social groups can feel represented in, in different platforms. And this is something we need to really figure out how to do it, that we don't have these um, places where some people talk and some other people talk in some, some other places. Because freedom of political debate is at the core of the concept of democratic society. We have to have the debate. It's not always nice, but we have to have it. And if you don't be in the same places, we don't have it. So the rise of hybrid democracies can also be the rise of diversity and tolerance. And this is something I really hope that this uh, conversation, what was happening now in Finland, might also mean. We are not in any road to Hungary or Belarus or any, anywhere. We are on our, on our own, own road and it can be this one. So uh, last thing, not to take democracy for granted. That's something that we really 
need to emphasize uh, in Nordic countries. And now the good news. <laughs> it, was, it was in the news. <laughs> so this uh, picture is from, from a Polish um, uh, TV, and it was after the, the elections there. I think we all uh, must be happy that the Polish, uh, vo Pol Polish people vote like they vote. I think that every triumph for democracy is shared. This is something that doesn't, doesn't really stop when the um, country's borders uh, are there. But we, we can be really, really happy that now Poland uh, has elected democratic way. It was funny when a Belarusian uh, journalist said to me that, do you, you know, also Belarusian have seen now the first free elections. It's only too bad that they didn't get to vote because they see it there in Poland. But it's a start. So, um, but what I, I also wanted to show you this because Havege, which I mentioned before, did this cover and it's using the Hungary's, um, uh, in, uh, I think it was 50s, <laughs> 56, when Hungary had, uh, had the, uh, rise, the people rise and uh, they took away the communism um, symbol of their flag. So they are using it there. So this is something I, I think was a very beautiful way also to uh, be solidarity when you are the one who is now suffering, but also that remind people that it happened before, we can do it maybe again. So, thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, I think we will go on with the next presentation and then we will have a sh uh, time for some questions, uh, if there are some. Uh, you also and already mentioned AI, and uh, we are all thinking about it mostly once a day at least. And uh, one of the experts on the f in the field is Carl Gustav Linden, who is a senior researcher and uh, presently a professor at the University of Bergen. Welcome. Yes, thank you. I thank you, Anne, for a very interesting presentation, a very important presentation. I'm going to talk about something which uh, I think a lot of us think about these days, uh, and that's uh, not just this information, but generative AI, the tools we use, most of we use already to sort of produce texts and pictures, videos, and other stuff. Very useful tools. But there's sort of a dark side to it as well, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, what happened one year ago, yes, actually yesterday, one year ago, the 30th of September, uh, November 2022, you're right. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about, so OpenAI, ChatGPT was launched, and that was sort of, for me, which had been sort of researching AI in media and journalism for the past almost 10 years, was sort of a huge step forward because suddenly we have a tool which makes it possible to understand how AI works. What is the data, where does the data come from? What's, what's the problems, what are the problems? What can we do with it? How hard it is to get something done? And so forth. I mean, it's, I think most of us, it's that somebody hasn't used ChatGPT for the past year. You haven't used it, <laughs> okay. So you're very alone, uh, not, not one, yeah, two person in the room. So that shows sort of the, the speed of the sort of the uptake of the, the new tool. And it's just not ChatGPT, there's a lot of other tools as well. So what I'm going to talk about is what is generative AI. I'm going to talk about some ethical problems. I should going to talk about should we be concerned? Spoiler, yes, we should be concerned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the problem with AI disinformation and the disinformation di dilemma that we really don't know the extent of disinformation in, in the Nordic countries. Uh, technology, we, I mean Silicon Valley, uh, open AI is looking for te te technologies are solving the problems in the world. Uh, that's not enough, certainly not. But that's a silicon way of thinking about things. Who is responsible? Who should, should we ask to sort of be responsible? And how are big are the risks in the Nordics? So, I mean, this open AI is very Silicon Valley. It's, it ticks all the boxes on the, on the list. Uh, it's about sort of a break things, uh, breaking things. You, you're not asking anybody about anything, but just do things. And uh, especially this, this sort of uh, AI system that's generally smarter than humans, 
the sort of ambition of the whole Silicon Valley and sort of the ideology of the technology in Silicon Valley. And I've, I don't think we're going to get there, but OpenAI has a mission with that. And the pr products are ChatGPT, which are text generating systems, DALI, which are generating images, and Whisper, which is sort of uh, transcription systems, which are all very good, but very flawed. Uh, what is generative AI? This is, I mean, I'm talking now from a journalistic and media perspective, so I'm looking at what sort of journalists are, are, are defining generative AI. Uh, according to Guardian, it's a broad label describing any type of art artificial in intelligence that uses unsupervised learning algorithms to create new digital text, images, video, audio, or code. The code is also really important here. That's sort of a, a feature of, of, of generative AI, which you, just data scientists are really use, using. And Swedish radios, chatbots, and that's true, chatbots are sort of interacting with these systems through chatbots. And I think that's the feature of, of generative AI, AI, which has been sort of the, for us, the revealing thing, that we actually can interact with these, these systems in a really easy way. And create new content, text, images, sound, video, and code based on user instructions. So we are sort of governing what's going to be produced in the, with these systems. So that's, I think that's the really useful thing about generative AI, which is sort of has helped us to understand what's, what's going on within these systems. And we have, of course, ethical problems. I think we all have found out about this. Can produce internal false images and, art and articles. They can also replicate the existing social problems, including historic biases. It's, it's uh, complex to guarantee the reliability of facts presented as truth. We should be aware that bias prejudice may be inherent in the models and editorial legal considerations may be needed regarding objectivity and impartiality. So these are systems which are sort of really flawed and we need to be aware about, about this. And I think most of us are because trying to create something from ChatGPT quite often sort of comes up with problems, something which is not true. And should we be concerned? I mean, yes, previously this information was created by humans. We always had this information in, for instance, in elections. I mean, it's always been there. This is nothing new. But generative AI can become a new effective tool for synthetic propaganda with hyper-realistic deepfakes, personalized propaganda, real-time propaganda bots, perfect tools for trolls. I have a sort of a sort of friend in the US which is an expert on this. He has 1,200 web websites producing fake news uh, supporting Donald Trump. He's quite famous, so I'm going to talk about him, with him about how he's doing this, because I think he's the real expert on generative AI. And uh, of course, social media does not carry responsibility for political lies, so I mean, fact, Facebook are not fact-checking political propaganda. And uh, OpenAI promised last year to monitor ChatGPT and propaganda, uses for propaganda, but I don't know, they have other things on the table right now, I think, looking at what happened for the last week. So that's also one concern with, for me, which have, having Silicon Valley companies that are that un unstable as OpenAI is doing things with the sort of the lack of, of leadership which, which should be in place for these really important things. And we don't know about why Sam Altman got fired and then got rehired for OpenAI, but there's some rumors that it had to be, we had to do, be done, something to, to do with sort of the, the fact that OpenAI are creating tools that will be able to, to, to break uh, security codes. You can, crack, crack uh, your passwords globally on a massive scale. So, I mean, all internet would be suddenly unstable. All your passport can be, can be de de detected. I think that's sort of really a scary perspective. So what connects 4 million billion people? Uh, United States, EU, Russia, Great Britain, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Taiwan. You probably know it's going to be elections, election year, a massive election year 2024. And we've already seen what happened in Slovakia, as Anne told us, this uh, audio tape, fake audio tape, which was quite well good, good w made, which was hard to detect, sort of, was it fake or not. And it was spread by fa through Facebook, which doesn't fact check uh, audio, audio, only videos and texts. So that was sort of a, sort of a glitch in the face Facebook's uh, moderation system. And we don't need to be look far to see who are spreading the, the, sort of the, the false information. Donald Trump, 30,000 times over four years, and the media repeated what he said, so there's super spreader with the system of the media actually acting on Trump's behalf, spreading the, the lies. 
and he's himself have used generative AI, AI for, for creating pictures. This is from Truth Through Social, his, his social media. And this is from, from, I think, from March, so this is not very good yet. I mean, all these generative systems are um, developing really, really fast. So what was able to be able to do one year ago, we can sort of perform much better th this year. And he's put this picture on Twitter. You see, this is not a very good picture. I mean, the, the head seems like quite sort of put on him afterwards. The hands are, you know, the six fingers on the hand, which, which was a feature last year. This, that's not true any longer. The pictures are much, much better. So it's really getting harder to detect what is fake and what is not fake. And this, of course, is used by, especially by Republicans in the United States against their opponents. Uh, AI-generated videos and AI-generated attack ad. I think sort of we talk about media and journalists. We're quite behind the sort of the communication and, and people, you know, advertisement people in the in the business because they are, these are using they are using these tools already in massive on massive scale journalists are still quite reluctant to sort of how to use this and what to do with it and this a problem with AI disinformation is is basically decisions we have to have to be made based on our best knowledge and this information can distort distort the process so we we make decisions based on on the wrong base basis and it affects how people obtain knowledge and participate in politics, affects the legitimacy of elections, and the broader questions about the future of democratic systems, as Anne said. However, many challenges around AI and democracy are not new. There is a long history of using AI to shape elections and democracy. And of course, tr truth and trust are essential and closely connected. So this is from, I'm collecting some ideas from, from people I've been listening to during the past year. This is Samantha Broadshow, Broadshow from American University in Washington, she's really good. And this is uh, where I and Mina Aslam are working with uh, Nordis. It's a col collaboration in, funded by the EU, the Nordic Observatory for Digital Media and in the Information Disorder. So there's uh, four universities. We've been working with this for the past two years. Uh, it's led by Aarhus in Denmark. And we are from Helsinki University, from Bergen University, Uppsala University, and then all the fact checkers in the Nordic region. So there's a, quite a massive collaboration funded by the EU, and it's part of the Digital Media Observatory, European Digital Media Observatory, with hubs covering all Europe. So this is a fantastic network, and it's going to be continuing. So we're waiting for, more, for the results from our funding application, which be, will be out this month, I think, uh, and it will continue for two and a half more years. Uh, the problem, as I said, with the disinformation dilemma, that we have to acknowledge that we we have limited insights into the true extent of disinformation in the Nordic countries, and that's sort of an overall problem. Measuring disinformation is really hard, and we're working sort of to find out with different indicators what is the, the sort of the truth of, of the disinformation problem. And of course, in Sweden and Finland, uh, as I said, talked about Faktisk. We talk about Faktisk. This is from from Morten Dahlbach who is the technology director of Factis, the, the biggest, one of the biggest no, European fact-checking organizations. It's, this is Norwegian, it's funded by the media industry and by, the, by, by sort of the media industry altogether. This is, I mean, Norway is a sort of a fantastic country for collaboration between the government, be, between academia, between public service media, between commercial media, which I haven't seen anywhere else in the world, actually. And Factis is one example of that. So the problem in Finland and Sweden, we have no funding for fact-checking, or very little funding. And very, we need the independent efforts against disinformation is limited, and on a small scale, small scale so making systemic assessment is challenging. And there's also the problem with the lack of data from from the platforms. We don't get access to sort of user data, or so we can find find out how the disinformation is spreading on platforms. That's impossible. So this is, these are things which will be de dealt with in Brussels uh, with the Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act and the AI Act, hopefully. We don't know, but we hope so. And European Digital Media Observatory have done hard work to sort of negotiate access to data with limited success so far. So our next steps, if we get funded, will be uh, to, take, to, to sort of deal with the important challenges for fact checkers to detect and respond to synthetic information, including deep, deep fakes and synthetic of artificial generated text. And it's a focus on fact checking processes, practices. 
But of course, fact checking will not solve the problem because disinformation is a matter of, of sort of resilience in the in the democratic systems or the, the society. So um, this is the sort of the way of dealing with it afterwards. What we need is pre-bunking, pre-efforts to pre sort of make people aware of what what's going on. But the media and journalists play a very central key role. So we're going to train knowledge journalists before the 2020 elections, 2024 elections in June. We're all also going to be testing and improving local tools already developed for fact checkers in Nordis One, because we need to reinforce journalistic and civil society ecosystems, as 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 Anna said. So this is one tool we have. have uh, we can check, find out about tools for fact checking on in a database. I think we have around 140 different tools, which we collected last year. We have a tank classifier which detects what type of tanks are used in the Ukraine war. Uh, this is sort of a specific specific problem for fact checkers to to see what sort of specific pictures or specific, specific tanks, what what where did they come from? Because the tanks involved usually tell us where, who is the one firing. And also language checker to see, you know, the transcriptions of YouTube videos uh, in Russia and Ukraine to find out what they are about, because this is also important and very difficult for people who don't speak Ukraine or, or Russian to find out what is going on and is this true or fake. And we also have a photo ver verifier to detect fake fake images, uh, manipulated images. And this is also, this is, has already the third, third iteration and we're going to develop it to forward fact checkers if you get funded and spread it all over Europe. And these are really useful tools for fact checkers because this is this is something difficult. And we also Factiverse will be a partner in our new new project. Factiverse is a startup, tech startup in Stavanger, uh, who is really smart in, in sort of creating systems that detect from text is this this is true or not. So this is a, a tool for 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 where you can see if this copy is correct or not, where the facts come from. And I think this will be really useful. This is already in a pilot stage, so you can, you can better stage, so you can test it if you want, if you go to Factiverse website and, and have a look. So tools are coming, but there, there's a gap between uh, emerging technology and fact checkers. I mean, fact checkers are journalists, not tech people. So they, they, they try what, what they, what they uh, see what they can do with it, but it has to be too complicated and has to be used in daily basis. So how do, you, do you, is it possible to deal with a massive flow, flow, flood of automatically generated video images, text in real-time access platforms? And who will get access to these tools? They have to be open source, of course, because you, there's so much out there, so you, have, you can't actually pay for things. You have to be, they have to be open access, so you can access them easily and try out is this useful for you today or next week. And of course, there has to be capacity building in, in media forensics to understand how, how you detect fake videos, images, and how you detect uh, fake, fake knowledge in, in texts. So this is one important point that, I mean, Silicon Valley thinks that you can solve everything with technology. We don't think so. Disinformation needs a broader approach than technical solutions alone. But we also need technical tools. This, they're really important because these sort of the, the disinformation spreading systems are based on technology. Uh, so, so besides fundamental issues, such as lack of deep understanding of the problems we want to solve, there are also severe, severe technical limitations due to, to, for instance, data issues, as we said about the platform data. So, I mean, this information is largely a social, political problem that needs a broader approach to technical solutions alone. And who is responsible for these, these, uh, these new systems of, of, of fake or, or at least uh, synthetic information and synthetic media? Of course, the ones creating these large language models, they have a huge responsibility, which they don't want to carry. Uh, those creating tools for synthetic media, uh, you, those, those user-facing tools, uh, those creating synthetic media, I mean, all those people, including my so-called friend in the US who has done all his websites, uh, institutions, organizations, uh, and those publishing and distributing synthetic media, news media platforms. So who is responsible? This is from Sam, Sam Gregory, who is uh, heading the witness witness uh, institution in, in the United States, working with AI and, and human rights. So uh, 
news media is actually taking its responsibility when it comes to, to gener generative AI. Uh, these are sort of guidelines from different news media in, in Europe, which we have, this is part of a article we have done, which will soon be published. Um, but basically you shouldn't publish uh, videos or images or text used with, b created by, by generative AI. Only for illustrative purposes to tell you know what, what uh, for instance, this information might look like when you're using Midjourney or DALI. And of course, I mean, this is a, a really important issue for, for media who has built this business model on trust. You can't sort of create things that don't, people don't trust. And you, being sort of involved with generative AI, AI has huge implications. I was in Copenhagen last week uh, listening to a conference on AI in, in Danish media and it was really interesting to hear how, for instance, the big news media companies in Denmark are going all in with gener generative AI, especially ChatGPT. For instance, Fiske Finsk Media has uh, trained 450 journalists in using ChatGPT. And Extrablad has really sort of rebuilding the business model on ChatGPT. And I'm sort of slightly concerned that you want to sort of get so involved with one, insta one such instable and and sort of, what would you say, new player in Silicon Valley. So these are some trouble you get when you're using ChatGPT. I guess this is ChatGPT. This is from January when CNET, which is, used to be a reliable, trustful news organization in Silicon Valley, now it's a click-based business model using uh, generative AI to create s stories. But the things, thing I found out when talking to the edi chief editor there, were, this is a place where I worked in in, in 2008, was that actually it wasn't the system generating create, uh, fake articles, it was the sort of the editor going through the, the sort of the, the articles created by the system and then improving these articles, which meant adding wrong, incorrect information to the articles. So this sort of a human, human error factor you had to count in when you use generative AI, when humans try to improve the, the, what has been generated by these systems also. So they have both the human factor and sort of the bias factor in the data. And of course, uh, social media is not taking the responsibility. This is uh, quite alarming. This is the, the moderators, language, the languages the moderators of Twitter or X are using. And you see no Nordic languages. They know they're not a single moderator in, in Swedish or Norwegian or Danish or Finnish at, at X. There's one in Latvia, I don't know why. And Croatia and Dutch one, Polish one, that's, that's quite alarming. So it's basically a, a English speaking moderation. So whatever, so we, anybody using X today realizes that this, this has become a mess, really a mess compared to what it was a few years ago. But it has never been quite the, never a decent tool for communication, but now it's really a mess and really a, a dangerous place to be for anybody. And this was troubles me. This is Adobe, which is, has been producing services for news media for 30, 40 years. Uh, Photoshop, uh, InDesign, the PDF, and other sort of really stable. They have a stable and long relationship with the media. This is stock photos from, from Adobe. Uh, stock photos showing the Gaza, war in Gaza. And you can see the whole Hollywood sort of quality of these pictures, and the, especially the picture in the middle. I mean, this is just. I don't know what to say about this, but this, this is pictures picture that, that the customers of Adobe, Adobe can use, for instance, news media. And I think that's, that's not the way it should be. And I hope to meet the Montgomery Silicon Valley in January and, and try to figure out how to get in touch with Adobe. So if anybody has a contact at Adobe, I will, I'll be happy to share if you want to share it with me. Uh, this is also a, a generative AI generated picture from Colombia by Amnesty, actually. So Amnesty has this in campaign against political police brutality in, in Colombia and using these pictures to sort of illustrate the campaign. And there's been a quite, quite a big discussion about is this okay or not? I mean, Amnesty should be sort of behaving ethically and is this ethical? But they say, you know, the only way to sort of have pictures from Colombia and police brutality is to generate them with AI. Because if that, that woman would be a real woman, she would be in jail right now and, and tortured probably. So they're protecting sort of the people in, in Colombia. So you can have it both. You, you can't have it both both ways, but that's the, the sort of the, the view of amnesty, and I think it's problematic as well. And now, this, last week, uh, Meta, or I used to call it Facebook, 
uh, announced a new tool for generating video and images with text prompts. And this is a really easy to use tool. Uh, so we have to see what's going to happen with sort of the disinformation, massive flooding through people using this and putting them on Facebook. Uh, I don't know actually, but it's, 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 it's worrying. So then Finland, we have a presidential election, election coming up in January and thinking about Finland, who of these guys do you think will use uh, generative AI to produce anything for the, in the campaign or their campaign bureau? Uh, I think one feature I ask the students, what do you think about these guys? They say, they, they say they're, they're really boring looking. <laughs> and I think boring is a good thing in this, in this world right now. Boring and stable. <laughs> this is from, from uh, Element ABC, which was actually a good, really good TV program last a couple of weeks ago. And as Anna said, we're quite resilient against disinformation in the Nordic, Nordic countries, especially Finland, which is sort of people are looking to Finland for sort of view for, for guidance on how to sort of deal with, with fake news and disinformation. And I think we should be proud of that. But it's, as, as Anna said, it's not sure that we will be this way forever. But this is sort of the, the sort of product of our school, school, schooling system. And people, especially in the US, wants to sort of get advice from Finland on how to deal with, with misinformation and disinformation and fake news. So this is uh, this one from the American University in, in Washington. They have sort of fake collaboration with, the, with Finland. And this you already saw, but, but thinking about the Re European elections, Yes, so this is, uh, you look at the list and Finland is number one and the Nordic countries are on, on top. But down the list you have a lot of EU countries which will have the elections like next year in June. So let's see what happens. And those are the ones that are sort of prone to, to disinformation because there's so little trust in these countries. So how big are the risks in the Nordics? Um, media education has a key role and media and journalists have a key, key role. Uh, there's a few, there are a few signs that propaganda has, has, has an impact on the population majority. But we do have a problem with people who are not following sort of normal the legacy news. Uh, minorities are vulnerable. We have seen minorities, for instance, Russian-speaking minorities following Russian media more closely than Finnish media. And uh, I don't think a deep fake will change our choice of uh, political candidate. I think we're too smart for that. But uh, I have an idea because I think that synthetic media generative AI will be used in the presidential campaign in January in some way because communication bureaus are very good at this, much better than, than journalists and media. And I think one, one suggestion would be that prompts should be public. The prompts written to generate texts and, and videos and, and images should be made public by the polit political community communication bureaus. I don't think that's, is, that's feasible or is, is realistic, but that will be one way to sort of open up the transparent, more transparent way of how they use, because the prompts are the, the sort of the, the prompts are the sort of the, 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 sort of the way we, we come to the end results. Uh, so I think that the biggest problem is not that we will be fooled by AI. We, I think we're too smart for that. But I think the pro biggest problem is that we will be we will not believe in anything and that will diminish trust. So I think that sort of it will gradually erode trust if you continue like this. And I think the media and journalism has media and journalism has a really big big role in explaining these things to the, to the audience. And I also don't think that that as I said, the Nordics is not sort of the most vulnerable to to disinformation. But if we look at the rest of the world, we are have a big problems. This is from Nigeria where a general dismiss, dismisses bloody legacy protest videos as fake. And this is this is uh, repeating itself all over the you know the world. People are saying this is fake, this is fake, this is fake, even though it's true. So uh, divide, deciding what's true is gonna be a real problem, which means that we doesn't trust we don't trust anything because it could be fake, it could be true. We don't know but we don't care. And I think that's the big problem. 
But again, uh, not everything is negative to end on a positive note. AI solutions can also provide better access to, inf access to information, especially automated translation to minority languages, especially support for people with special conditions. And we could have AI chatbots can be signed to, chat to support citizens with relevant information. And of course, we will develop tools that will detect, uh, detect this information better than now. I mean, but it's, it's coming late, later than sort of when, when those tools are they're generating this information have been developed. So we're always, we're always behind sort of the, my friend in the US who has this 1,200 fake websites, unfortunately. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Carl Gustav. That was really enlightening. And um, uh, it was interesting with the discussion about prompts being public. Uh, I suppose most of you already know the meaning of that, but I recently got to know what prompt can, uh, means in this context. It's the instructions you give the AI. And, and making those public would change quite a lot, I think. Uh, I suppose it would be wise to, to go on with um, Minna Aslama now because it's so closely connected to what Carl Gustav said. And uh, what do we really trust in the Nordics and are we different from the rest of the world? The floor is yours, Minna Aslama. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here and talk about um, something that we all share and cherish, the Nordic democracy. Yesterday, I participated in a um, round table where a, a very, um, how would I say, respected international organization that measures democracy around the world was talking about their latest measures and specifically Finland. And I would say that, um, it was um, wonderful and assuring, but also sobering. And in, on that note, um, I would like to say that that's what I, uh, the news I bring you. So I uh, bring more positive news than Anne, and I support <laughs> uh, what uh, Carl Gustav just told us, but I also bring you some sobering news and, and some things we should consider. And what was really interesting about that, that wonderful presentation of the organization that the UN consults and so on and so forth was that I found out that only next year will this organization actually involve citizens' opinions about the state of their democracy around the world, right? Up until now, it's been measured by views of experts. And while we need the views of experts, isn't it so that we really need to know what citizens, what all of us think about democracy, how we understand it, and then how we understand the word that's been floating around already this morning, trust. What is trust? How do people actually experience it? Instead of us saying we measure it this way or we measure it that way, well. Um, I here represent um, Edmund Ordis. No need to say more about that. Uh, Carl Gustav already introduced you uh, what it is. I also represent a, um, a, a huge research consortium called ADECA, uh, which researches people's uh, capacities to, to understand and process information, as well as uh, those capacities of institutions and the Finnish society. It's part of the, uh, one of the research consortiums of the Finnish um, Strategic Research Council. And uh, warmest thanks at this point to uh, uh, Auckland Media Foundation. Uh, because of Auckland Media Foundation, we in the academia, uh, uh, where it was possible for us to do a four-country survey research in the Nordic countries. Normally, we don't have those kind of funds. <laughs> um, why we did this? Um, it's interesting that um, what, what already Anne introduced us, the idea of the Nordic media welfare state, that has been a, a slogan that has floated around uh, over, uh, over a decade. It's actually being challenged. 
And uh, in several Nordic uh, interview research we did, we heard this all over again. The Nordics are living in the borrowed time of societal trust. And then it's also very interesting that we have actually quite few, quite uh, few, um, not few, or not more than few comparative statistics on Nordic audiences, especially when we talk about trust, uh, not just do you trust the media or what media you trust, but more broadly. We really don't know much. And if we have these shared values and a shared Nordic welfare society ideal, at least, and that extends to the media, we should know more about that. And then, of course, if we have these shared values, if we value Nordic uh, media welfare society, what could be some common strategies? We're very, Finland is a very small country, um, Iceland is a very small country. Uh, if we want to have any impact in the EU, for instance, how could we have common strategies, shared information, shared knowledge? Oops. And of course, um, there has been an attempt for that. Um, uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers set up a think tank to think about the Nordic democratic debate um, in the era of big tech. And it, um, as you can see in the right hand corner, it gave its recommendations and we're going to hear more about that in the afternoon um, from Tobias Bonacke, who was the chair of that think tank. To be very, very um, transparent, I was part of the think tank as well. So that all prompted us to do this survey. Uh, what did we do? We did really a traditional uh, uh, repre nationally representative survey, and we took some, some questions, some cues from, for instance, the Eurobarometer and the Reuters Digital News Report that asked very simple questions of what kind of media you trust and, and um, do you uh, experience disinformation? Uh, just to know, and I heard this from the European Broadcasting Union, that for instance, Eurobarometer, which is the EU um, survey um, set of surveys, does not measure trust in the media anymore for some reason. I don't know if that's going to be brought back, but even in this day and age, that 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 was dropped from their their um, their set of uh, questions is interesting and. Uh, Let's hope it comes back. So even so, that that I feel this this survey was uh, especially important. So we did the Finnish pilot in May, not knowing that we would get funding uh, f from Orkelund Foundation. Um, so then June we did the other other three Nordic countries, and these were the themes, and these are the themes that I'm going to talk to you about. So let's start with views. Very typical question of these kind of surveys. Frequency of views. What do you think is the most used social media. TV still has a significant role in the lives of, of Nordics. Then streaming services, and here people were not uh, asked to make distinction between, let's say, Netflix or Wiley's Arena. And then uh, uh, websites and apps of legacy news organizations. So these are the most used media sources in the Nordic countries. Importance. Ta-da! This is the very good news for us. Legacy media uh, in digital format is very important uh, to the Nordics, Nordic audiences. TV again, very important. Radio and then only social media. And what was very interesting is that paper newspapers delivered to home were also mentioned as fifth or sixth most important information news sources. Power of the media. How do the Nordic audiences feel about the media in the society? Uh, I don't want to bore you with a ton of uh, statistics because, as you know, uh, they are uh, relative and the way you ask the question uh, you know, determines the kind of answer you get, but just to show how similar these four countries are. So, um, the, the survey asked or gave some statements and asked um, how, 
do you agree or or uh, strongly agree with this? Um, do the media have a uh, significant role in shaping public opinion in politics? And on the other hand, shaping political decision making. So 83% uh, thought that uh, the media or agreed or strongly agreed that the media has a um, strong impact in public uh, opinion and then 68% in decision making. Look at the other countries. We're practically identical. And maybe due to the high level of, of media literacy, we've been taught since we were very young to be critical of media and to understand the power of media in the society. Maybe that's part of the thing that actually explains this. And some other statements of power. 40% of the Nordics, and, and this is an average, but, but uh, an average in these, these four countries, think that objective reporting is not possible. Isn't this surprising? What I learned yesterday in that, that event about uh, uh, democracies in the world is that one of um, the, the, um, one of the things that brought, for instance, the, the Finnish index down was the fact that in, in Finland, Finnish, uh, female experts and female journalists are significantly harassed very often, especially on social media, of course. And here we see something else in our wonderfully equal societies. Audiences feel that women do not have equal opportunities to men to have uh, a voice, sorry, voices in the media. And over half of the respondents felt that journalists often color news according to their opinions. And of course, here we have a little bit of a, a political, uh, um, the leanings of, of audiences' political views. So this was especially prominent, surprise, surprise, among those who are more right-leaning in their political views, especially those who affiliated uh, or had the, so, so had um, said that they, they are, um, they have voted for the populist parties, and then those in the left felt that business reasons have a uh, big impact in um, journalists, uh, in, in uh, the media. But again, good news for you. Over half the respondents felt that national media offer a variety of perspectives. Accountability. So we asked also who should monitor the media, who should be at the end accountable of what kind of information we intake, what do we trust, what do we believe in. This was the biggest surprise for me personally in the study. A majority of the respondents felt that it's, it's the role of the individual to at the end, to choose, to understand, to be literate, to educate oneself. And for instance, the law, role of regulation and the, and the state wasn't really popular at all. And this becomes a, uh, that now I'm coming to the bad news, uh, as you will see in a few. This is slightly alarming. Are we all capable in the context of AI to truly be individually responsible only? So, because this research was also part of the, uh, the Nordisk Observatory, we, we also asked specifically about disinformation. I think this means that disinformation is an everyday occurrence. It's, it's part of our, 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 our citizens' everyday life. It's kind of alarming that people feel. Oh, but also, 20% of the respondents felt that they don't know. They don't know if they encounter disinformation. Again, we don't know if, they, if, if the respondents did counter disinformation. This is their experience. This is what they report. But 20% and plus didn't know. And only about 50% feel they can assess whether what is fake in the media and what is not. Finland actually was an exception. In Finland, about 70%. So this is a very different kind of result that we get, for, for instance, for the media literacy index. This is how people themselves feel about it. 
other statements. So here we're talking about statement of, do, uh, am I worried about the impact of information uh, warfare? Am I worried about fake news? Am I worried about too m that, that my life is uh, sort of flooded with too much social media impact or too much information? This also tells, uh, tells us a little bit about the sort of, th that the media landscape is, is a little bit of a, a burden. It's worrisome. It's not something that, that uh, the audiences embrace for, for joy and information and, and education, but, but there's this continuous worry. And finally, we come to trust. So personally, um, I have to say that the recent academic research sees trust as multidimensional. It has to do with the fact that um, do we, do we trust uh, the media as an institution at all? Do we trust particular news sources, maybe particular journalists or influencers? How do our own experiences, emotions, education, age, and so on and so forth, how does, does that all uh, affect what, how we experience trust? That all does. So whatever I've already told you, although it's sort of simple survey information, is part of the experience of trust, really. But then we, of course, asked whom to trust. What do you think was the most trusted source? Anybody? Most trusted source? Media. Family and friends. <laughs> but close second. And uh, not far behind, but still other legacy media. But public service has a clear, clear, clear status in the Nordic countries, whether uh, it's reflected in all age groups, let's say, in, in uh, use, it's definitely reflected in, in what uh, the audiences feel. And I think this is also the sort of uh, legacy of the uh, Nordic media welfare state, that, that sort of public uh, commercial media, mixed media landscape has been our, our forte. So these are three things that audiences say that, that are, from their opinions, uh, issues that, that create trust in the media for them. They, they mentioned so they could choose from a variety of reasons, and there were so many reasons, but these are the top three. It's interesting, isn't it? Accuracy of information, independence of journalists, where they were saying, you know, journalists really you know, often are not, not so politically uh, balanced or, or independent. And the use of clear and informative language. I think this, this, result, uh, this is a result that, talks a lot of, uh, that uh, tells us a lot about the fact that people feel this sort of information overload. And, and we did some qualitative work with Finnish young people, and they said the very same. They feel that even they, digital natives, who navigate uh, this sort of multimedia, plat multimedia um, reality so easily, even they feel like, give us the information and the news in a simple, clear format. That makes us um, feel that the information is to be trusted. But it is ever harder for the audiences to feel that they can assess the veracity and reliability of information that they counter. And then researchers talk about these fancy wor words, effective polarization and epistemic communities. But that basically means that we can start to see that, that people really get very polarized, not only in terms of, of uh, the, the trust has to do with the fact that not only how they, uh, how they uh, assess things, whether they're factual or not, but how they feel about them. And we start to see how, how uh, societies there are groups that feel very differently about certain, certain things and, and don't care about facts. This is no news to you. But what is then created, and what also Carl Gustav Gusse mentioned, is this, uh, this epistemic community. So what we start to see is not a Nordic media welfare society, but different little communities that have different news sources, that have different understandings, for instance, what democracy means. 
in sum. So we're here to celebrate and to protect the Nordic media welfare state. And the results make me think that legacy shields us, but not forever. And this is also, as I said, the, the opinion of experts that we interviewed in different Nordic uh, research uh, efforts. And of course, just what Gusa said, this is getting more and more complex. So I want to ask you and I want us together to think about it for the rest of, uh, of today and beyond. What is our vision and what real actions different stakeholders can take to ensure democratic debates in the uh, Nordics? And I do think that that embracing the idea still of the Nordic media welfare state and the role of national media in that context and collaboration between the Nordics is essential. And then again, another question for us to think, what can we here in the Nordic countries, what can we give to Europe? How can we be role models? How can we be role models globally? Thank you, and you can find the report in this website. Thank you very much, Minna. And now we have time for one or two uh, short questions and brief answers if you wish to pose some questions. I have a microphone here which I'll bring to you because we want also the stream viewers to hear though the stream viewers will only see your neck when you're posing the question. Yes, here is one. Yeah, so, uh, hello, thank you everyone. I'm Elsa Kivinen, a project assistant from Faktabari. And um, this question is probably to um, uh, Carl Gustav. Um, it's very interesting to, to know the um, high awareness of uh, media literacy, but how much does media literacy itself help if there is very little uh, media coverage about certain topics, which is the case about EU elections and EU parliament um, topics in Finland, I think. And I know from my workplace that there is a lot of the fact checks that we do are um, related to EU decision making. So I think if there is not enough media coverage about EU-related matters, um, how can we deal with the, um, how can we deal with that fact? Well, I think the problem is human curiosity. I mean, what do people want to know? What should they know? That's sort of the eternal problem with journalism. What should you de deliver? What type of news to the to your audience? And of course, you need to sort of give them news that they may, might not be interested in. But in today's newsrooms, when it, you know, the business model is based on, based on, on paid subscriptions altogether, there's no, almost no ads any longer, then you need to produce what the audience actually consumes. So you, you steer your production of news through the metric system of the, of the newsroom. So that, that becomes a problem. So I think, I think journalists should more f think about what the audience really needs and, and, pre and present it in a way that is interesting. Uh, I think that's but that's the challenge. Should you how, how do you make EU elections interesting if they're not involved in any sort of really dramatic features? And that, that's sort of an eternal problem for journalism. And I think Caius has he knows much more than me about this. Do you, Caius Niemi, want to complete to to say something? Well, talking about the EU elections, that's a, that's a big dilemma, of course, but I would, I would emphasize that there is a big difference between Finland and Sweden, for instance, what comes to the, uh, 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 the, the electorate um, and, uh, and the, uh, the, 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 the percentage of, of, of people voting. So I think it's, uh, it, it, the question is much larger than only media. It's also like how to educate um, um, uh, youngsters and, 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 and children to the political system and uh, to, the, to the society at large. And that, that also includes media literacy. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a big question now how to prevent uh, deterioration of uh, our welfare society and, uh, and the de democracy. And that has to start from the very beginning of the, of the schooling. There is a question. 
Hello, my name is Tobias Bonnage from uh, the Think Tank that Mina was talking about before. And I think you were first, but now I got the mic. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so this is a question for all the participants. I, I really like the way Carl summarized the current state, that uh, the, the big problem with AI is not that we will be fooled a single time, is that we will lose faith in, in the, our entire trust, if uh, faith in uh, information. So I'm just wondering, what is your best guess at how are we dealing with this huge problem? Because I, as I see it, media literacy and um, fact-checking is really good tools at dealing with not being fooled by AI, but it's not tools for dealing with not having any trust in each other. Thank you, Tobias Bornake. Who wants to answer that question? Well, when it comes to fact-checking, I think fact-checkers are doing a great job, fantastic job, but it's not noticed by many people. I think there's sort of a... It has to be better, better marketed uh, in, in new ways to reach a larger part of the population and, and present it in a way that people understand that this is important to me. I think that's something which we which will work with in, in sort of the next stage of the Nordisk project, this value propositions for fact-checking, actually sort of explaining why this is important and making sure that the message goes through and maybe writing fact-checks in a way that they become more interesting. Now you're starting to raise your hands. <laughs> Minna, please. Yeah, I actually want to continue what Caius just um, said in the, for the previous question and answer to be as answer to you uh, in that kind of way that, that we also, not only do we, do we need to highlight the value proposition of fact checkers, but also make us all aware how important trust is. And because we start to see already a few years, even before COVID, in the trust research we did for Finland, we start to see that not only is there sort of a little bit of growing distrust to media, actually much less that we would uh, we would guess when we look at how everybody's talking about how nobody trusts media. Actually, there's much more trust, but there is this distrust between citizens, and people feel like. Well, I know what fake news is, and I know how to navigate this multimedia landscape, but you don't. This is how people feel. And, and so people don't trust how other people get their information. And so we have to, again, Caius, I fully agree with you. We have to teach democracy, and we have to teach that trust is part of democracy, and that has to be part of education, sort of beyond uh, traditional media literacy education. Now I give the floor for, for two more comments, Petra. Thank you. Uh, Petra Wikström from Shipstead. I'm heading public policy. And we at Shipstead, we work quite a lot with AI, first of all. And I think we, we, all, we know, of course, the different challenges, but we very much also want to look at the positive aspects. And I think trust in media and AI is a big project for us, uh, which we are looking at. And I think it's also quite important, of course, to remember that we, uh, in order to, for us to be able to do all of these things, we can also fact check, actually. It's not only fact checkers, but we can also, as media, fact check uh, the images, for example, the memes that are out there on social media. But we also, of course, need to have sustainable financing of media, which is very, very sort of volatile at the moment, uh, also in the Nordic market. But I had one question, actually, to Gusse, and uh, I'm working a lot with EU uh, regulation. And we, of course, have the Digital Services Act that regulates now illegal content on social networks. But on EU level, we also have a code of practice for disinformation, which is facilitated by the European Commission, where all the social networks are members, except from X that actually uh, exited from it. Uh, I'm hearing in Brussels a lot of criticism towards this code of practice, and there are even talks about should we regulate disinformation in the next EU mandate. We are quite concerned about such prospect at Chibstead, but I would like to hear your view. I think Minna is probably better than, than me on this, but I think the problem is to measuring measuring the, this information or mis misinformation. That's really difficult. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think one part of, of why should we have the code is that platforms don't report properly on it. And I think a lot of the criticism has come from the recent reports of analyzing the reports from the platforms. So we really don't know anything. And the problem is... I guess we ha want to know the extent of disinformation, who spreads, and so on and so forth. And, and the access to data is so complex and, and, and difficult. So I don't think there is a problem with sort of this kind of self-regulation, uh, self-governance measure as the code, but nobody follows it. Or very few, I'm not saying nobody, but 
the big platforms really don't consider it as anything. And, and you know better than most of us about the climate in Brussels with the lobbying going on from the platform side. I mean, they're totally dom dominating the, pub the, the public debate in, in Brussels. <laughs> Just quickly, that uh, that also the, uh, the the fake news laws are being misused by many authoritarian governments, and so we can see, for instance, in Singapore, the uh, how, how it has been evolved. Yes, we have the rest of discussion during the break, and uh, now before our lunch break, I will like to give the uh, floor to the chair of the Anders Studenius Foundation, who is one of our main partners for this event. Uh, and now we will have a short ceremony. Thank you, Henrik. And um, the Chudenius Medal is uh, uh, granted to persons who uh, promote the ideas and ideals and aims that were important for under Chudenius. And uh, it's granted by the Association for the Chudenius Institute based on suggestions given by the board of the under Chudenius Foundation, whose uh, uh, who, who I'm represent here, and uh, I'm happy and, and honored to. No, Annalena disappeared, but <laughs> she was there for a few seconds ago. I'm uh, honored to to to, 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 to say that uh, this year's Children's Medal is granted to Annalena Lauren. <laughs> and and the motivation goes. Uh, Journalist Annalena Laureen is awarded the Anders Chudenius Medal 2023 for her courageous, uh, unwavering and tireless work in which she has built bridges for a reliable flow of information between Russia and the Nordic countries. In her work as a Russian correspondent, now also Ukrainian, and author, Laureen puts, in, in, puts into words and explains complicated political and social phenomena which would, without her insights, remain remain mostly incomprehensible to the Nordic reader. With analytical brilliance, Laureen skillfully places the development in today's Russia in its historical and geopolitical context, and in a true spirit of Chudenius, offers answers to the reader's thirst for information, what is happening and why. And I skip a, a little part and said, putting all her knowledge to good use, Annalena Laureen reduces ignorance and increases understanding of what may seem to be unknown. In her work, she defends and maintains under Chudenius' basic value, the right to access and disseminate information. Congratulations, Annalena. <laughs> Can we hear her voice also now? Jag tror du har, du har, kan du få på din mikrofon? Yes, hörs, hörs du och nu, hör vi nu, nu hör vi dig. Och mm. vi kommer överens med Anna-Lena att nu, nu lämnar vi engelska och för en stund går över till, till svenska och, och finska. Grattis. För, för det Tack första. så hemskt mycket. Det här är en av många orsaker till att, att du, du, du tilldelas denna medalj är att du förutom att rapportera om, om, rapportera om, om situationen i, i Ryssland och nu också Ukraina har aldrig särskilt eh, satt fokus på att berätta om, om dissidenter och aktivister och oliktänkare, inte minst under din tid i Ryssland. Hur ser du på dem och deras roll för demokratin, inte bara i Ryssland utan också i ett, i ett vidare perspektiv? Ja, när det gäller Ryssland så har ju dissidenterna en otroligt, otroligt viktig uppgift. Uh, framförallt därför att jag tror, det var också så under Sovjettiden, att de påminner om att, att det finns alltså här en, någon som säger sanningen. Och det finns många människor i Ryssland som vet sanningen om till exempel anfallskriget mot Ukraina och en massa andra frågor. Och, och det här är... Och det här gäller, det är inte bara dissidenterna som vet, utan jag skulle faktiskt säga att majoriteten av ryska folket nog vet, åtminstone i stora drag, vad kriget i Ukraina handlar om. Problemet är att man inte vill säga det och man inte vill erkänna det ens för sig själv. Och dissidenternas roll är ju att säga det som ingen vill säga. Och i Ryssland så har man en tradition av mycket modiga dissidenter och mycket modiga oppositionella. Och just nu 
sitter större delen av dem i fängelse eller i exil. Och jag vet själv som nu och här korrespondent att de här modiga ryska personerna har ju blivit väldigt marginaliserade nu för att, för att vi rapporterar om annat för att det händer så mycket annat i Ukraina. Men det är väldigt viktigt att vi kommer ihåg dem. Och en dag kommer det här kriget att ta slut. En dag kommer vi att tala med Ryssland igen och då är det viktigt att man har någon att tala med. Och just de här människorna så är otroligt viktiga om Ryssland någonsin ska utvecklas till någonting annat än ett auktoritärt samhälle. En av äh, de många motiveringarna för, för ditt pris är också din förmåga att, att äh, för en, en nordisk skandinavisk publik äh, förklara vad som sker i det, i det ryska och nu också ukrainska samhället. Hur, hur, hur lyckas du med, hur, hur svårt är det här att du har jobbat nu länge i Ryssland, nu jobbar du i Ukraina och, och samtidigt ska du rikta dig till, till oss som sitter vid våra papperstidningar eller skärmar och, och, och dricka morgonkaffe och, och, och läsa dina, dina texter. Hur får du det här att gå ihop? No, det är ju, på sätt och vis är det både lätt och svårt. Alltså, all journalistik är ju grunden samma överallt och journalistik, journalistikens principer är, är väldigt enkla. Att, tala om så gott man kan vad det är som händer och varför det händer. Men, men i dagens läge då när, när Ukraina befinner sig i ett krig så är det väldigt viktigt att man vet vem man talar med och vilka källor som är pålitliga. Och jag, jag har varit väldigt noga med när det gäller krigsrapportering och huvudtaget att jag aldrig citerar varken ryska eller ukraina, ukrainska myndigheter som om det vore ett faktum. Alltså de u, u, uppgifter som ryska och ukrainska myndigheter lämnar ut så så kan man inte liksom läsa som objektiva siffror. Därför att, och det här gäller även Ukraina. Trots att Ukraina är ett demokratiskt och öppet samhälle så är Ukraina ett samhälle i krig. Och när man är i krig så är det andra saker som, som man prioriterar ibland än att vara helt och hållet sanningsenlig. Och, och det här är viktigt att förstå och som journalist måste man förstå det. Så ja, det, det är väldigt viktigt för mig vilka hur jag citerar olika uppgifter och källor, men det absolut viktigaste är ju att vara på fältet och prata med människor som lever i det här kriget. Och det är för det vad jag håller på med just nu, jag är i Kharkiv och gör ett reportage om, om min röjning. Och, och det är väldigt intressant att märka att det finns en stor kunskap i Ukraina om min röjning, det finns ett stort engagemang för min röjning, men byråkratin och, och liksom väldigt, det här svaga administrativa kunskapen, alltså sätta käppar i hjulet. Och det här är ett väldigt typiskt problem för Ukraina. Alltså det finns enormt mycket kunskap här, enormt mycket potential här. Och så finns det ett gammalt sovjetsystem som förstör väldigt mycket fortfarande trots att Ukraina är ett öppet demokratiskt samhälle idag. Mm. Ja, Tosta jatkar en niin, niin... Vaikka sympatia me ovat vahvasti Ukrainan puolella, tiedämme myöskin, että Ukraina ei, ei ennen tätä sota ollut demokratian tai varsinkaan, varsinkaan korruption esimerkkivaltio. Niin miten sä sanoisit, että, että sananvapaus toimii ja toteutuu tänä päivän Ukrainassa ja, ja voiko sielläkin olla, olla toista mieltä hallinnon kanssa? Ukrainassa voi hyvin olla toista mieltä hallinnon, hallinnon kanssa ja... Ukrainalaiset ilmaisevat tämän koko ajan, kun mä itse puhun niiden kanssa, niin on hyvin helppoa kun, tai niin saada ja kuunnella kritiikkiä muun muassa presidentti Zelenskia vastaan. Ja tietysti samanaikaisesti on Ukrainassa nyt olemassa sellainen niin yleinen asenne, että nyt pitää pitää, pitää, niin pitää yhtä ja puolta yhten hiilen, koska maa on, on sodassa, mikä on ihan ymmärrettävää. Mutta kyllä mä huomaan koko ajan asuessani täällä, että esimerkiksi kritiikkiä presidenttiä kohtaan kasva koko ajan ja ihmiset yleensä eivät ollenkaan pelkää ilmaista sitä. Mikä on minusta demokratian, sehän on hyvin esimerkki siitä, miten demokratia toimii, mutta kiinnostava kyllä, jos kirjoittaa tästä kritiikistä, Serenskistä, niin, niin tuota, <laughs> saa aika paljon kritiikkiä näiltä Ukraina, tai ihmisiltä ja lukijoilta Suomessa ja Ruotsissa, joiden mielestä jokainen kritiikki Serenskiä kohtaan niin on osa jonkinlaista pro-Venäjä-narratiivia. Ja tästä meidän pitää päästä irti minusta Pohjoismaissa. Et solidarisuus Ukrainan kanssa ei tarkoita sitä, että puhuta ongelmista Ukrainassa. Ja mun työ, osa mun, työstä, mun työstäni on myös kirjoittaa Ukrainan ongelmista, mutta myös ukrainalaisten rohkeudesta 
ja miten he selviävät sodassa, mikä on, niin kuin, se on aivan uskomaton tarina. Ja minusta ei ole kiinnostava kertoa niin vain yhtä puolta, vaan pitää yrittää valasta kaikki. Tack ska du ha. Tack. Jag gratulerar ännu till priset och tack för det jobb du gör och, och, och kraft och, och, och inspiration för det fortsatta arbete. Allt gott. Tusen tack. Tack, kiitos. Thank you, Anna-Lena Larenis, uh, making a report, report on minesweeping in Kharkiv at the moment. So now we have come to the point where we'll open the door and, and uh, proceed to the uh, restaurant or to the uh, open spaces at Hannaholmen. Uh, I also want to uh, say au revoir to our viewers on YouTube. We will continue the uh, stream at 1.30 uh, p.m. in uh, uh, 12.30 p.m. in Finland. And now uh, we'll have a break on about an hour and we'll come back at 12.30. Thank you. freedom of expression and media, as Gunvor mentioned in the morning, we have constantly been discussing the future. And uh, I'm so happy to introduce to you the moderator of the upcoming panel, and uh, the panelists will be presented by you. Welcome, and the floor is yours, Kaius Niemi. Thank you very much. Um, Really, really pleasure to be here, and uh, and uh, a warm welcome for all of you, uh, our dear panelists. Um, uh, this is actually something which has not happened, at least you know, very often. I was thinking that uh, together with the, with the panelists that the, that have we ever had four Nordic editors in chiefs at the same time uh, in the same panel, and, and and at least we didn't remember that to happen. So, so it's actually very, very interesting. And of course, the times are very interesting. Um, there is a, a very strong representation of, uh, of, of uh, hugely important institutions and, and, uh, and, and, and also, um, you know, modernizing, uh, digitalizing uh, legacy media. And I was, I was actually counting that how many years together all your newspapers have been in this planet. And, 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 and the years are, are altogether 646 years uh, of publishing newspapers that you are representing here where you. So, so let's, let's start from the, um, from the, from the, uh, from the left side. Um, we have um, uh, Christopher Alquist from Göteborgs Posten. Um, your newspaper is 210 years old. Um, you are describing you as a uberuende liberal. 
Is that so? Yeah. And you have started 2017 as, as an editor-in-chief. So yeah. warmly welcome. Then we have Erja Yläjärvi, uh, uh, editor-in-chief of Helsingin Sanomat, which is 134 years old. <laughs> young, yeah. <laughs> Actually youngest and at this panel. You have just also um, uh, began as, a, as an editor-in-chief um, a couple of months ago. Uh, but of course you have been working for Helsingin Sanomat, many other newspapers. Uh, so we can, we can think that you are very senior. And of course... Um, done as well you have you have uh, you have um, um, worked uh, as an editor in chief uh, since 2020 yeah and then we have christian uh, jensen from uh, from politiken from denmark and uh, the only newspaper is 139 years old yes and uh, and you have you have been in your current position from 2016 so warmly welcome for you all we have quite quite broad topic um, it's uh, it's tech media and the future but i think you know it's uh, it's really important that we get um, it, it in this chaotic world some sort of like structure and uh, and in order to do that we are having this hour to uh, to speak about like um, interesting First of all, is that in the digital area, the what's may not be as much a surprise, but a happy surprise at least, it's that that like the journalism that works for our business model is unique journalism, and and that's uh, it. It might be wrong to say that it's a surprise because we all hoped for it <laughs> during uh, the digitalization, but that it actually works with unique journalism. It's 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 a happy surprise at least. It's it's not. Uh, click-baiting journalism that will support our business model in the future. And I, I think uh, if you go back like 10 years ago, people sort of believed that. I mean, people, the new, men, some newspapers were about to lose the track of where they were going. They were doing more clickbait journalism, but now we're going back to more unique journalism. And, and as I said, it might not be a surprise, but it's a, it's a happy thing at least, I'd say. journalism will kind of prevail this is what yeah um one but surprise for me maybe five six seven years ago is that how angry public got with social media i didn't expect people to become this angry in finland maybe in in other countries neither uh it doesn't surprise me anymore unfortunately but mm. some somehow in the way it was mostly the negative surprise we got uh, then technically the other surprise was that how quickly the kind of what we thought was modern digital newsfeed, which still is our main product, became legacy as well. Because if I th look at my children, uh, the sort of newsfeed, text-based newsfeed, even with algorithm, is legacy. So now we have two legacy product products for young audience: print newspaper and the digital newsfeed. Uh, and that surprised me because we thought, of course, that we would get rid of one of the legacies. And we didn't because print doesn't die happily, mm. <laughs> as we know. So maybe those those two things. Interesting. So you. Back in the day, you know, we, we were all ad ad financed, financed by ads. Also, the big broadsheets were actually financed by ad advertising. Uh, but now we see one thing is that we, the subscribers are paying for the content. Uh, and what has surprised me uh, positively is uh, how positive that has been for the content and the quality of the content, because you can't pe ask people to pay for things that aren't good 
trustworthy, high quality. So it has really developed the journalism in a very, very good direction. But it also challenges us in a, in a much broader sense to, to be trustworthy. That, that, is no, uh, that doesn't come by itself. Mm -hmm. So there's a positivity here. Yeah, I can, yeah absolutely. I can Must be positive. Yeah. yeah, good. How about Christian? Uh, that's very good answers for all of my colleagues here. So I'll just add on uh, to say that, that once uh, for 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago, every year we have said that uh, legacy media will go down, will be destroyed. We have new digital uh, uh, movements and uh, other things that will uh, destroy us. And we are standing here, we are standing here brave and great, uh, and we are doing what we are going to do in a, in a democratic society, uh, making journalism. And um, I think that the, the, the last uh, years has, has mentioned that we have lots of uh, possibilities and lots of threats, and we have uh, this uh, morning heard about lots of the real threats about the democracy and, uh, and the whole uh, public uh, way of uh, uh, joining the democratic uh, uh, way of, of behavior. But it all comes down to one thing. We are moving forward, but we're also going back. Back to the basic, back to source criticism as the core of our business. And when we are strong in source criticism and journalism made, as Sina mentioned, we will stand strong and we will do good things for democracy. Mm -hmm. So so you were actually um, really uh, thinking that the uh, that that the the way of, of, of doing things, you know, in a classic way will prevail. Now, now, Eria was was worried about the, uh, the the methodology. I mean, not really about journalism. I would say, if I'm interpreting you, you're right. But but the way that uh, that you know, is it video, or text, or so that there, there would be a disruptive element here? Is that something to be worried about? You know, that the people are not uh, younger younger people. They're they're consuming news so differently that uh, that it it gets outdated. Uh, the products in these in this fine uh, legacy institution and I'm, I'm going to to give the word to area now because yeah, you yeah. uh, colleagues might have wiser things to say but I have been wondering a lot about this sort of uh, that that reading what happens to reading what mm. uh, what happens to written text and and I'm not thinking that it will die and the Finnish language will not die and we are selling text as and good text good language mm. is what we sell good structure and uh, comprehensible journalism is what we sell, but the younger audience uh, do not read in the same way we did. They don't write at school. They, when they graduate, they have different kind of language. English takes over, and I have been wondering if it's a threat or not that they they watch news as reels because there are there are good reels as well. There are good mm -hmm. explanatory reels about Gaza and Israel, and they very very well informed, of course. They already live in this kind of hybrid uh, fake news uh, mixed with real news. It's all in a sort of mishmash era. They already live it. We still kind of uh, observe it from the outside, whether it's a threat or not. It's a threat if we can sort of adjust as quickly as we have to. It might be a threat, but as a whole, I don't see it as a threat. Trina mentioned that, that having this um, subscription-based uh, model in the digital really di was, was uh, enabling the, 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 the old newspapers to sort of like reinvent themselves in the digital. Do we need a, uh, a new kind of a strategy, you know, uh, tackling the, the issue that Eria is, is talking about? I agree with both uh, Uria and uh, Christian, um, because uh, Christian, he is uh, pointing out that the core of journalism, I mean, the main thing that we do, we seek information, we are critical to sources, uh, we show people how we work, we have to do that to a much greater extent than we've been used to, uh, but we have to tell the stories in other formats. 
because if something does worry me, it is that uh, the younger audience, they meet content in formats that, you know, is developed by companies that have thousands of UX designers and developers and a newsroom like Oftenposten, which is a quite big newsroom in, in Norwegian uh, terms. We have perhaps five or together with the other in the, in the group, uh, 100, 200, mm. that's really nothing if we are competing with Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, which are developing formats in a tempo that we can never compete with. So we have to, uh, it is a challenge for us to develop the new formats uh, where we see that younger audience are, but we have to be there and compete with our trustworthiness mm. and try to sort of uh, convince the younger audience that you have uh, information and then you have uh, quality assured information and information you can trust mm. and we have to work with that uh, to a much greater extent than we do now than mm -hmm. we have been doing we have sort of been waiting for the younger ones to grow up and then they will come to our platforms that's not going to happen mm. I mean we just uh, we just uh, released this text to speech functionality you can listen to all the texts uh, mm. at often post them and what we see is that younger women with children they enjoy that. They are so busy. They are multitasking all the time. The fathers of these children aren't that busy somehow. <laughs> but the younger women, they are really busy. So they say, I need to have something in my ear. I love podcasts. I love to listen to text. I can listen to the news story, but I can't sit down and read, you know, mm. 8,000 um, words mm. news story. That they, they, they won't do it. So they won't subscribe if, if we force them to read. Uh, with the life situation they're in. So I think we have to understand where the audience is, have to respect their life situation, and then we have to sort of keep the core of our content and not try to compete mm. with the big tech giants, but we mm. have to see what they're doing and learn from it. So you're coming back to, to Christian's idea that like, you know, coming back to the to the basics and really take care of it, you know, in order to, to, to keep up the trust and, and be in enticing at the same time, isn't it? Yeah. And I, I think that as uh, democratic citizens, we need to be optimistic on behalf uh, of the civilization. The civilization want to be informed, factor-based, and that is a struggle these mm. days. But they need and they want to. And and we can see in, in Denmark as well as in in, uh, in Sweden and Finland and and, and Norway that uh, subscription, digital su subscription, is is increasing. Uh, dramatically these uh, years and also a uh, young audience is uh, paying for factor-based journalism mm. and I think that's uh, a very strong symbol uh, for, for the future the common generation want to be informed factor-based mm. they also want to be uh, everything uh, else uh, 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 but 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 basically they want to be informed and what what can what i can be afraid of is that the perspective perspective uh, perspective of reality is uh, is different and broken uh, for the for the younger generation and i think here we have the also uh, our medias but uh, the broadcasters uh, uh, as well, public service is, is very, very uh, necessary to, to, to be strong uh, now and in the future. As we saw uh, Minna Aslama's uh, uh, slides, uh, there's the, the, the uh, public broadcasters have, do have a, a really important role along with the, with the newspapers as well. Uh, it was also interesting uh, what, uh, what, what Carl Gustav Linden said that, the, uh, that the, is, if, is, there, is there at least uh, you, um, any any trust of um, of, uh, of of anything anymore when 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 the synthetic media is is coming you know through AI so that's that's another question let's let's talk about that a little bit later Christopher you had something yeah yeah I just think we're already pinpointing the biggest challenge for us forward uh, of course people want this uh, fact based uh, news and and uh, source criticism but it, but but as we heard earlier today we heard both that uh, you were saying that we were had to be like a bit boring now. It could be good to be boring, mm. but on the other hand, uh, you said that uh, we left the field open on TikTok, and that's the hard things for us to not be boring and do this source criticism in new formats and and like produce high quality content. And I think what we have to develop is like our 
way of doing this source criticism with really, really good storytelling. And that's our biggest uh, challenge forward, I believe, for news media. And it's not easy to uh, to create headlines either, you know, because because uh, the, uh, the 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 headlines that the um, that that the uh, that the um, um, evening newspaper medias and and tabloids are, are are creating they are very enticing, and so so there is also a feature that that that, uh, that even the newspapers uh, the, the 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 classic newspapers uh, headlines might become more sort of like uh, manipulate manipulative. I don't know if you see that. But they, uh, do you see that as a, as, a, as a question that is being discussed in the editorial room? Well, I have had a half, I have been editor in chief for a tabloid, so I might know something about it. I, yeah. What we have seen in Finland and all the other Nordics, well, Dan Denmark, I'm less familiar with, is that public service headlines, uh, daily paper uh, headlines like Helsinki Sanomats and uh, tabloid headlines, they have getting more and more similar. Mm. So tabloid headlines compared to what they were at the 80s and 90s, you might remember, but I have looked at the archives, they are nothing today what they were, so they have actually become more serious. And in Finland at least they are under self-regulation, they are quality journalism in their category, of course. So what we see is kind of similarization of the headlines because there's an expectation that you need to be able to be get interested in seconds or, or parts of a second. And that's, that's uh, for everybody. And that also the sort of, we always talk about young audience when we talk about that you have to be quick and interesting, but the older people are get losing their sort of uh, tolerance as well, that they are getting more and more short-tempered and sort of they are watching cat videos like everybody else. So I don't want to isolate this discussion to, to teens who are very, very aware of the world. I'm more <laughs> worried for the older ones who are also not immune to the fake information because they have not been sort yeah. of, uh, they have not faced it in the same way, but in a sort of kind of half defense of the tabloids here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would say that it's, it's, it's clear that the, uh, that the older generations are, are not always behaving very well in the social media, as we have seen. So, <laughs> so uh, sometimes the younger, 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 younger population are actually like, you know, behaving even better. So, uh, so there, 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 there might be kind of, a, kind, of, kind of a twist there, which Eria actually mentioned. But how chaotic has the social atmosphere you know, uh, created and been around your newspapers recently. Um, has, has the discourse, you know, got really intense, you know, among your readers, you know, maybe maybe politicians and so forth? How, wh where are you now? So uh, the good thing about social media, if yeah. you look at it from our perspective, is that uh, we get the criticism right away and we get a lot more of it so we can learn from it and we have to relate to it. I mean, when I started in this uh, business, you could get these uh, letters telling us you made a mistake and then you looked at the letter and perhaps you had room for it in a week, perhaps two weeks, and then you printed it or you didn't. Uh, but now that's impossible. If you make a mistake, someone s make you aware of it immediately. So it makes us sharper. Uh, that's a good thing. And uh, of course, you have the democratization of the, of the debate. Uh, but of course, what we see is that some tendency to the newsroom can be too aware of what's going on uh, in social media. I talk about it a lot in my newsroom. I talk about this Twitter panic. All journalists, they, 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 they are on Twitter. Almost no other Norwegians are, but all the journalists are. <laughs> uh, and they are so sensitive for w what we call the Twitter storms. Yeah. Oh no, we get a lot of criticism. It's from him and her and her. And I, and I say, okay, cool down. Who are these people? Okay, it's him, it's her. How many followers do they have? 50, we don't care. 10,000, let's take a look at it. And then you have to look at the substance of the criticism and see, do they have right? Or is it just that they are able to mobilize a lot of people against often posting that makes them right? Not necessarily. We have to, you know, lower our shoulders, get into the substance and discuss it. But I just see that in the newsroom, many journalists, they, they get total panic if they get some Twitter storm against them. And that makes them uh, worried to get into some topics. But media is also they producing. They don't want to write about. Sorry, me media is also producing a lot of stories uh, on these uh, uh, maybe uh, individual Twitterists that or existists who are, who are just uh, writing something. So uh, media also amplifies. Yeah, we lift them up. 
Yeah. Uh, and that's, of course, the, the problem with the fake news uh, that we, I think we've learned a lot, that you mm. shouldn't lift up anyone from Twitter criticizing anything mm. and just uh, write a story about it because there can be other motives than what we thought there were. So how about you? I mean, is that, how chaotic is it, the, uh, the, the, the environment around your newspapers? Um, it, it's quite chaotic, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, but there's two ways of looking at it. One, one is that social media is less important for us nowadays. I mean, the traffic from social media has dropped a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like the most important source for us uh, nowadays so for, to gaining readers. It's, it's still quite important, but it's not as important like for four years ago or something. Uh, but of course, the picture of us is being set in those areas, and 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 right now with the Israeli Hamas conflict, it it has been really, uh, really uh, high debate about it, and and it's I, I believe that it's two different persons that are like uh, criticizing us and using us in different ways. It's both those guys that use us as a political weapon, that want to use us like a way. Uh, to like instabilize the society, uh, we see that, and those people, those are hard to like win over, of course. Uh, but then there's also a lot of young people that see, for example, a lot of pictures and movies from inside Gaza on social media, and they see that we just don't publish those, and they wonder why I don't you do this. And and those people are the important ones, those we have to win over and try to explain and be early in like setting our like guidelines for about how we like reporting about this conflict and try to like win as many as possible over uh, for not make them into the people that uh, believe that we have like a secret agenda or something. But it's hard because it's hard to reach everybody. I mean, they reach other people and, and so we, it's really hard to win them all over. But I think these are the two battles we face right now on social media. So uh, basically, if I'm interpreting you right, so uh, so some of your readers, some of the public uh, thinks that, uh, that the newspaper is taking sides. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Definitely, and and it's from both sides as well, both pro-Palestinian side and, and the Israeli side. They both are criticizing us uh, and think that we have an agenda on the other side. Mm. Uh, yeah, and and in the beginning, actually, some of our like uh, our subscribers also were like contacting us about this, uh, but they're they're easier to like to explain, <laughs> and they they see everything that we do. The people that we only have contact with in social media, they just see like a fragment of what we're doing. So it's harder to like explain our role and what we're doing to those people. And, and that's why it's important for us to be in these areas, to be on TikTok, to be on mm -hmm. Facebook and Instagram, and, and also try to explain for all those people there. What, what do you say, Erja? You have been, you know, um, leading a, a type tabloid, then Swedish speaking, uh, Swedish language newspaper, and now Helsing is out. So, what's your feeling about this? Yeah, well, uh, I recognize a lot of what Trina is saying. Mm. I've been actively talking uh, in our newsroom about the need to leave Twitter. Not, not saying that you need to, you must leave Twitter, but not to engage because the meaning of Twitter or X is going down very, very rapidly. If you spend too much time there as a journalist, you miss out on other journalistic opportunities. Like I've said, we must be on the field, like Anna-Lena Lauren says, we have to be and observe how the world is, how not it, how, how it not how the world is seen or experienced on X. And also, like um, Anne Lepervi here said, that like, like in the elections, only true Finns were active on TikTok. Are we actually seeing the whole of the social media if we put too much emphasis on Twitter and X, where journalists have been very, very active? Journalists, uh, especially the senior ones, are not as observing TikTok as actively. I'm not propagating the benefits of a, a Chinese platform, but it's a fact that it's, it's, it has strength. So we are missing out on other opportunities, and it's not good for you to be agitated as a journalist, it's not good for you to become angry or stressed, L you lose your competence, so the price is too high, uh, it, it's better used elsewhere. Um, I'm not too um, worried about the sort of social situation in Finland, uh, it's been getting more and more angry, like I said, for the past five, six, seven years. But it's it's not at the level that we would not be able to do our work. Mm. It, it's more like you said, that these sort of people are panicking uh, about things that they might not need to. 
I'm not saying that you should tolerate everything. It's very, 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 very important to sort of differentiate between the sort of real threats which actually happen uh, around some topics, especially immigration. And then this you are talking about, but I think this is going under the radar more. So there's a lot of psychology involved, being irritated, but also like um, having a risk of self-censorship, you know, is, if being constantly attacked and, and really, if you're looking at the ex all the time, uh, what, what people are saying of you personally. So it's very personalized, isn't it, Christian? But how, how, how's, how's your surrounding? Is, is, it, is it chaotic around? Politic yes, it's, it's, it's very chaotic every day, <laughs> <laughs> every minute. In and out. Um, I totally agree with my my colleagues here, and I'd, I just uh, want to add on that in Denmark five seven years ago, uh, a critical big part of uh, Danish population said that we don't need to subscribe legacy media. We get our news from Facebook. At that time, uh, every person in Denmark, I think it was 95% uh, of the, uh, the entire population were on Facebook. So that would take over uh, the news uh, business right away. If, if you're going to a dinner to, to, tonight in Denmark and s saying that you, uh, I'm only getting my, my news from Facebook, mm. I think that you will uh, get a very, very bad evening. Uh, so that was a threat. Mm. And I think we, we, we need to be calm about what our business and what we are standing for. So I, it, it is uh, historical and, and it is... Uh, uh, even violent uh, when we come to when it comes to uh, to uh, uh, Palestinian and, uh, and and Israeli uh, conflict, mm. uh, but we need to be to stay calm and and do our business uh, as journalists. Mm -hmm. uh, keep, keep loud and carry carry on. Or yeah. How do we say it? Yeah, I, I recognize this yeah. situation, but 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 I, what I believe is a problem for the society is that uh, not everybody has gone from saying that you get your news from Facebook to legacy media, they said they get from Facebook to non-legacy media. And, and we're like, I believe there's a big risk that we're missing out a big group of people. Mm. And they're going to get bigger and bigger, not, not like in the majority, but we're going to miss out a lot of people that for like 20 years ago, everybody had the, the paper. But nowadays it's, it's been more uh, segregated in that way. So we're talking about hybrid media as we have been talking today about hybrid democracy. So it's really like hard to actually look at all these angles at the same time because there's so many new layers now. What do you say, Trina? Uh, just uh, two points really, because uh, we, we uh, made some, did some research on the younger users and right. many of them are news avoiders. They think there's so much news, so much information, and uh, so much uh, negative news that some of them say that uh, um, it depresses me. Uh, so we, we have this podcast called Explained, Forklort, where we go into depth for one story every day. And that really got traction uh, among the young users because they say, okay, one story where, where you really get into what this is all about, then, then I have what I want this th today. And we were, of course, hoping that they would get into the main product through this podcast. But many of them say that I don't read uh, newspapers online. I don't. I don't relate to news because I, I, it depresses me. So I have to protect myself. So that's, that's one thing. And the other thing is that we have to treat TikTok like a field. Uh, things are happening that, there that young people really relate to. Uh, they have opinions about. They engage uh, everything from cooking to you know Palestine, Gaza. Everything happens for them there. So we have to be there and and uh, survey it and find out what's going on, make stories about it, and sort of help them to navigate in that field as well as in the traditional fields. It has said that the uh, the algorithm of TikTok is the most powerful uh, and enticing algorithm in the whole world. Um, and, and, and definitely it, it, it has got results in order to, to get people really, uh, really into it. And there are many people who have never visited TikTok and cannot understand what's going on there. Um, do you, uh, Arya, yeah, yeah I, I recognize this sort of I, uh, news avoiders and they are getting older. Uh, 
Yeah. Because uh, every podcast I personally listen to, they are mostly American kind of self-development, uh, neuroscience, uh, academia. Every advice is like, if you're stressed, go away from the news. Of course, it's for the American audience, but we, we, see, we see news avoiders. Time is heavy. Uh, it's too much, especially with the pandemic and, and war and economic downturn. And it's very dark in Finland in November, December. So, and there are two, two new, new groups uh, coming up, and one is news avoiding, avoidance. They care about their health and well being and family, and they're very private in the sort of where the interests are local for the, for the most part. But also, this kind of distrust that you are not um, objective. And, and in Sweden, they have, you have very established kind of alternative medias. We don't see them in Finland, but th there are signs of it getting to Finland as well. And if you put these two groups together, they are very, very different, but they might grow, both of them, on wholly, wholly different grounds. But if the, these two sections get very big, the rest of the public... Uh, Will it will be only a fraction. I don't see a huge risk in Finland, but I see signs. Mm. And then you add on these kind of different storytelling formats and TikTok for uh, observing a Finnish life. It's fantastic. You see farmers, young people telling about what they do for a living. You never see that on Twitter. Never. You only see people's opinions on something, polit politic. But on TikTok, you see everyday life. It's a field. Of course, better to be at the field in real world, but uh, a lot of negative things have been said on, tic on TikTok. But I see it more positively as the public images, not the, ch not the ownership, ship, but the, the form. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, why I have been emphasizing the word chaotic is that we do have models in order to understand what really go goes on, and I have liked uh, really much um, the uh, the model of uh, of the of the of the Finnish book uh, called Totuuden uh, Jälkeen After the Truth, which was published in 2018 by Finnish um, uh, for for Finnish journalists and and uh, and researchers Anto Vihma, Jarno Hartikainen, Olli Seuri, and Hannu Pekka Ikäheim. And they were looking at, you know, what has happened uh, when digitalization and also the uh, the, um, uh, the the the, the uh, polarized politics is is uh, having a double impact. I'm going to show you now the uh, the basis of the of the model. So here you have an upper corner political polarization. Politics is 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 getting more ap active. Then you have the technological change. And even one could say that this is an old model dating from 2018. And I, I still could think of, 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 of that this is, is very useful now when talking about what is going on, which seems to be pretty chaotic. So you have four corners here, which is uh, post-true strategies on the, on, the, on the right upper left, uh, upper side, which means the systematic method, methods used by populists and those driving identity politics to influence beyond established <laughs> institutions, such as media. Then you have crisis in media, which is driven by pretty much by the technological change. Uh, meaning that financial difficulties of the media combined with decreasing news consumptions among the youth, which which was d discussed. Then you have power net networks, which is uh, which means uh, the transformation of uh, of formation of echo chambers among like-minded groups that are not really willing to to discuss uh, between each others. And we might find ourselves in in that in those groups as well. And then there's the crisis of ex expertise, which means harassment of researchers, journalists and experts, and, and downplaying of research knowledge. And so how much you put like weight on in dif different corners, it depends on the time and, of course, a person who is using this model. But for me, at least, you know, this was very useful in order to understand that where we might be heading and what which corners might getting better as well. So not only a dystopian, you know, uh, landscape, but also where we should put our emphasis. It would be really, really interesting to to hear your thoughts uh, as an editor in chief that like uh, which corner to tackle or what what makes you sure of of the future and unsure of the future. Or would you have another corner to to add on? <laughs> Who wants to to uh, to start? Maybe maybe Christian. Long silence here. 
we can, we can take some questions as well if uh, in the meantime when 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 our our dear guests are are, are thinking but but uh, if 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 Trina wants to say something we don't get, need to get too academic here I can try start go ahead so, so yeah. be aware of me be with me, with me. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe that all of those things comes back to what Christian said before that we need to really like continue to focus on what is our unique selling point. And that is people that trust us, and that is that we do fact checking, that we don't uh, lie, that we don't, we make mistakes, but we say that we make mistakes. And, and, and I, I, I tried to think about it like, before it was this big campfire, the newspaper was the big campfire, and, and uh, everybody was gathering around it, singing Kumbaya or something. Uh, <laughs> Full monopoly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but but then like the power of networks happened as well. So like in, in yes. like in Gothenburg, we have this big train tunnel that is being built, uh, and and people are really 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 angry about it. They don't and it doesn't matter how much we write about it. They are still angry at us that we don't write enough and we don't like tell everything and and so on. Uh, but still, even though they are in this the network, they still understand that their network doesn't have the legacy that we have. So they still want to be a part of our, <laughs> our campfire. <laughs> so they come to us, and that is what I believe we have to like focus on if we're gonna survive in this, uh, yeah, what we were calling it, to like continue to have our unique selling point that makes us, still makes us this campfire. Then people will have small campfires on the side and sing gangster rap or like heavy metal or something, but then they come back and sing Kumbaya with us at some times. And I, I believe that that's the way we have to like navigate in the future. Different music styles in, involved. So how about you, Trini? No, I, I just want to tell you about an initiative that the Norwegian media mm. uh, established, and it has mm -hmm. something to do with the post-truth strategies and the way that we are challenged with fake news, fake photos, fake videos, yeah. uh, which started really during the Ukraine war. We saw that all the newsrooms were sitting there trying to verify videos and photos because we can't publish one photo that isn't real from a from a real place from this exact date that it says it is. You know all those things, and there are millions of photos and videos streaming and by uh, passing by us every day, and people trying to insert fake uh, images in our uh, stories to after that tell them that look at this newspaper you can't it can't be trusted mm. this is happening every day uh, and then the no norwegian media organizations all the big ones they came together and they said okay let's uh, cooperate on this because it's in all our interest that the public trusts us so together with the national broadcaster uh, often post and vega all the five big ones they uh, established an office together and they say okay now we put some of our best people in here and then we verify videos that everyone can use, a any media organization in Norway can use. And we picked it up again now when, the, when it exploded in Gaza. Mm. Uh, and of course we do a lot of verification in the newsroom as well, but now we are uh, increasing the competences uh, in all the newsrooms that uh, want to take part for three weeks or three months, it depends how many resources do they have, to learn verification and OSINT method methodology. Uh, so that they can verify this kind of uh, information themselves. And you also see, I think, that the trust in the media is stronger in these areas. And we are more, we, we can defend ourselves against these uh, flows of uh, fake images and videos in a better way than we could two years ago. So you are confident, you know, uh, we, we saw a, uh, a stati statistics uh, before this panel that, uh, that stated that 50% of the Nordic population thinks that journalists often color news according to their opinions. But uh, you think that these kind of uh, actions that you are doing within your newsrooms and with between different different uh, news outlets could make the situation better, which could be seen. And we have to say that we have verified this video. We yeah. have verified so you have to market it as well. Yeah, we have to market it yeah. all the time. How about Christian? Thank you very much for your help, Trina. I think that was uh, my silence before was uh, I was missing something in the, these four categories: uh, the ethic uh, method uh, and the ethic be behavior of uh, media. And I think that uh, what can makes us optimistic 
uh, for democracy and journalism is when we, as legacy media or other medias, can to our audiences tell them that we are not providing anything that people's eyes haven't been on hand has always been on what we are publishing. Mm. So I think this is this is right, but it 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 will turn false uh, if you if you don't uh, mention the ethic dimension of uh, of being uh, media in the digital world. Yeah. So you would a actually add a a sort of like a layer of uh, of ethical uh, ethicality, uh, so to say. Um, yes, because when yeah. you see all that uh, mm. uh, f four categories. It's getting dark as uh, Finnish yeah. winter. <laughs> <laughs> How about area? Yeah, yeah, Finnish winter also, again. I, I was <laughs> also wondering about the sort of four dimensions. Yeah. They are huge and they are yeah. all true. Yeah. And I think the sort of how to remain optimistic is that not to try to solve them all at the same time. And I've been wondering a lot about the sort of not taking too much weight on our shoulders or journalists' shoulders. It's a huge yeah. responsibility. It's important for the democracy, but democracy can crumble even with good journalism. If the judiciary goes down, if the police and military start behaving weirdly, if the politicians become all populists, it doesn't actually, it's not enough to have good journalism. And I think that's sort of, I think this is my optimism, because I think the sort of we don't need to take everything at once, but be aware of these things and start to solve them in a very sort of pragmatic way, like Afton Poston and you, you, you guys have been, have been doing. And then about the bias, it's a sort of hop off from the sort of big pictures. I think we need to be more open, not only about our working methods, also about the risk of bias, because even a strong feeling is a bias. If you feel very, very, very strongly about there's no other alternative for Finland than to be a NATO member, you're passionate, there's no alternative, this is the only solution. Are you objective as a journalism? It might be national interest. It might be the sort of result uh, everybody approximately agrees with, but are you objective? No, you're not. And we saw signs of it, I want to say, during our Finland's membership of NATO, which I supported. Um, so the bias discussion it has not been very open in Finland. We've been too defensive about it. Uh, we've been saying, no, 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 we are not biased, we are objective. You can see when it's columnist. Uh, I think that's important, but the picture is can be dark if you yeah. start to tackle mm. it all at once. It's I, I think the one of the value of the model is to be able to sort of like make visible those strategies that are try to be uh, underneath the table, so to say. So the post-truth strategies that, for instance, politicians are very often used, uh, they are being wrapped up into uh, into a kind of a way of saying that uh, that uh, talking about impartiality and uh, and and uh, and blaming new, uh, uh, media of uh, things that, that that the media is not all about, and uh, and and very often. Um, uh, it's hard to say but, uh, uh, that, that this is part of a clear-cut strategy, that this is a, uh, a, a, a strategy that is being uh, used by different people, by different uh, organizations, by different, different, uh, uh, in, in different means, in the way that eventually uh, it's very, very, um, um, uh, gives a really, really big results. And the result might be the trust when you're crumbling and trying to get rid of the inst institutions and, and the trust of ins institutions, if you are repeating the same stuff again and again, then it might be very successful. What do you think about it? No, we, we, we see that uh, many politicians, they are quite media savvy. You know, they, mm. they know how to, to work the public. To If they know that we are working on a negative story, then they suddenly go out on Facebook and say that, you know, this and this newsroom is working on this story and here is the real story. And they haven't even published a thing. Uh, that's a quite known method. And then they have 60,000 followers or something go, oh no, I hate that media. And they are so, you know, I'm giving up my subscription. And, you know, before we've published anything, that has happened. Uh, because they have a big following, uh, which can really... And I think there and then, and we've talked to many politicians about this, there and then it can be very tempting to do that. Uh, but they should think about around the next corner, because what they are doing, they are really 
eating of the trust of the media, which is part of the democratic infrastructure that they so depend on. So we have to be in dialogue with the politicians and the people of power all the time, just think, okay, you, you, w you won this one because you came out the way you did, but the result is that you are part of the, of the, the army trying to build down trust for one very important part of the democratic infrastructure. And do you really want to do that? But is that a asymmetrical uh, playground where the media is not having enough power to uh, to repeatedly say and 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 defend uh, the the core values of of, of of trustworthy journalism at the same time when there is this so much of this noise which might affect? What do you think? Is this is this asymmetric, or do uh, do media has have got enough power to 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 defend and and proactively? Um, um, take care of the of of, of its uh, core values. When you see the the, the analysis of, of, uh, about, uh, and I th think that it's uh, both in Sweden, Finland, and, and Norway that uh, legacy media uh, trust uh, trustworthiness uh, is increasing mm. uh, this year. So, so I don't think that uh, that we are we are uh, pushed back uh, mm. in this uh, in this uh, era. Uh, so uh, I don't think uh, that's the big uh, threat for us. Mm -hmm. Any other other thoughts? I don't see it as a big threat in Finland. Uh, Finnish media outlets, the national ones, are huge. They have a reach that is outstanding in Europe. Uh, so so it depends on, of course, then if you take Sanna Marin with her Instagram, then it's more huge. But but. But I think as a whole, we do have very good capabilities of defending ourselves, yes. One interesting thing is, is that, uh, that the, the media uh, companies in, in the Nordics have actually adopted a destination strategy, which means that uh, there, is v there are very few aggregators, uh, unlike in very, uh, many other European countries. And there is a similarity between uh, more you have aggregators, uh, then less you have trust in the media. And that's because now uh, the public is gravitating towards the brands. So Göteborg's Posten is important for the for the Göteborg uh, area area citizens and 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 and, and so forth. So uh, I th I think that has got also something to do with the trust also in the future. Um, then there is this really really big and weird um, stuff coming in, which means it, it's the it's the AI. And according to Nina Schick, who has uh, written a, a book um, which is called Deep Fakes, she has claimed that 90% of the online content produced by synthetic media, 90% uh, of any content online uh, is being produced by the synthetic media by 2025-26. Uh, that that that's something which is really really interesting. So it, would there be m a potential new threat that uh, that uh, everything what we see is produced by synthetically, um, just regardless of what you guys are doing in your editorial rooms? Yeah, well, I think it's something that we talked about on, before lunch as well. Uh, that that the problem isn't that people won't believe what we do, but. They, uh, that they are being fooled, if that they don't believe in anything at all. Yes. Uh, but that's also, if 90% of every content, of every content on the internet will be like generative in some way or, or synthetically uh, manufactured, then we will have even a more unique position, and we will be something contrary to that. And that might be a possibility for us instead, I believe, if we are able to like. Uh, be transparent about the way we are working, what we do, how we use AI, because we're going to need to use AI in, in some ways. Um, but we have to be really clear on how we're doing it. <clears throat> and that's not easy. Uh, that's not easy either, because it, it's really hard to like decide when we, when should we point out that we have been uh, using AI in some way. Because you can, you know, you can you can write an article and then you can like put it uh, after it's been published, put it into ChatGPT or something or your own language model in some way, and and ask, uh, give me ten examples for a good follow-up on this story, and and then you get to, and you can use that like like uh, 
someone like an editor or something. Of course, you have to be aware of that it's biased in some way. But and if you do one of those articles, should you like show that to the readers then that, yeah, some part of this ID of this article has been like uh, produced by an AI? Should you use it? Should you write it to the readers, or should it? Is that just a tool that you're using? Mm -hmm. So you are actually like uh, thinking uh, a little bit like Christ, uh, uh, Christian that uh, that there's a competitive advantage there that everything is handmade and a human you know having a human touch so to say. Yes, but we we have to I, I try to motivate uh, all our journalists to experiment with AI. You know, sure. just dive into it. Look, uh, how can you use it? What can you do? And then we have to discuss uh, the experiences that they do and then see how, what can we use, what can we publish, how do we uh, market, how do we say that, uh, which part of this do we, when do we have to say that I used an Excel spreadsheet on this, I didn't <coughs> do the calculation myself, we never do that. Uh, I never say that I use a spelling program on the text, but we do every day. Uh, well now we uh, publish summaries every day of the main stories that ChatGPT has made, and then we say, okay, ChatGPT made this, but it has been controlled by uh, our journalist. So we, we also always have a human hand on it, and we mark that, but we have to use it. It's a great opportunity for us to simplify processes and journalistic work and, uh, and put together data in, in with data journalism. I mean, now... We have perhaps five data journalists that really could do code. Now you can use these tools and suddenly you have 50 because you can use the code, but you have to go over it with a human uh, look and, uh, and an expert has to look at it. But the ability and the possibilities that are in here are, are huge. And then of course we have to handle the threats and we have to talk about it and be transparent and have an AI policy that we share with the audience. They must, they, they have to have the opportunity to ask us, mm -hmm. how do you use this? Uh, and how do you tell me what you use and how do you do it? So we have to be more transparent than ever, but we have to use it. If not, we will sit there and we will be out of business in two years. Christian mentioned the the, the, the ethical part. Uh, do you have any 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 AI ga guidelines already? In, uh, yeah, we published ours um, a few weeks ago. It's I think it's still very elementary. We are also testing summaries. We are also wondering what kind of like what parts of the editorial process technically you can you must leave to the machine because it's it's gonna uh, spare time to sort of think and be creative because that's what we are going to sell. The machine can only do what's been done before, for for now. The sort of dystopian dream is that they are more capable than we are, but not yet. Uh, there are different levels. There's this sort of news process where I completely agree with you. Um, sounds very much like our approach. Then there's this sort of local level. I think the sort of showing who we are, who our journalists are in Helsinki, in Gothenburg, in Oslo, Copenhagen, like there are people. It's easier for a small market and small community than it is for the United States with 300 million people. But then there's the the, the really dear, really difficult one is that the sort of deep the fake and when the authorities, when the government, when the military start using it, uh, like with with wars, like with Trump, with politicians, and that's our weakest point. And we have to be open about it because there are going to be incidents. I, I assume that even with all these kind of even national fact-checking things, that 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 things uh, that mistakes will happen because this is a human business, and how we deal with the mistakes is then we, when we are going to be tested. Uh, it's easier when the fake is something we can then confirm. Okay, we realize it was a mistake. Let's be open. Uh, it was wrong, but when it's uh, military, police, American government, Israeli government. We are not being. We, we are not able. Let's face it. We are not able to go to the source. Was it fake or not? And and that's more of a serious problem for whole global <laughs> democratic system and then for us. But that's the sort of third and most difficult domain. I think I have no answers for that. Mm -hmm. For other parts, ideas and and also optimism. Any other thoughts of this? Of, of this. So we, we have two minutes. So uh, so let's let's um, let's finish up with uh, with some thoughts of, of of the future. How how um, 
how do you see a future with a couple of a couple of, of, of sentences a future uh, of uh, of media and and uh, and journalism in your own countries having a uh, a very nice nordic uh, set here i am uh, op uh, very optimistic uh, in, in denmark we see that uh, that the young population is is actually uh, being uh, subscribers paying for news uh, younger and younger not 15 years not 10 years uh, when they are on t tiktok but in denmark uh, in in when they are 27 years uh, from that age they they want to pay for uh, for content uh, from legacy news and i think that's very very optimistic uh, uh, to be honest uh, how many of us uh, paid for for content uh, news content when we were 27 years old <laughs> 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 How about you, Trine? No, you can't be in this business if you're not an optimist, uh, because uh, everybody's talking about how we're dying, and they've been doing that for 60 years. Uh, so, so I think we will we will go through this. But I think the the digital transformation that many of us have been living through for the last 15, 20 years, we thought that now we were transforming. Uh, but now the next transformation is, is starting. Ria mentioned uh, some of it, and I just we have to really take that seriously because I don't think we really know what we're heading into. But we have to be motivated and, and make our people motivated to go through that because uh, and have our ears to the ground and, and find out what is our place, what's our position. We've been doing in the Nordic countries so well. Uh, through these uh, 10, 15 years, better than almost anywhere in the world. So there's no reason why we shouldn't continue doing that. But it, it needs, it takes hard work. Mm. And self-criticism as well. Sure. Yeah. How about Eric? I completely agree. I'm turning 47. And, and if you're not an optimist, you're not doing this. But at the same time, I, I am not only optimist, because one big question we didn't tackle today is this sort of how to get new people to the branch. Mm. This is very complicated. Uh, business and very complicated area and people are tired. We are standing here as very sort of privileged in a way that we get good compensation. We have sort of kind of autonomy, even if the pressure can be high, but the sort of how to lead this transformation with young people who are not all alike, who would think differently, who would have different capability, expertise, uh, have and, and remain optimistic. Because, and, and so that's the sort of where I see uh, some worrying signs, but as a whole, we're, we're going to be here in 10 years as well. So taking maybe we, we, maybe some of us. But taking care of the, uh, the, the, the younger generation, both the readers and also the, the doers, so the, the, the journalists themselves. That's a good point. So. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic as well. Um, <clears throat> for certain, for like big newspapers, I mean, it's going to be tougher for local ones, uh, and, and especially local ones that ain't in a, in a bi within a big company. That will probably be more or less impossible, mm. um, and, and that's sad because it's like uh, less less views in some ways. Anyways, when when you get in a, in a big big uh, brand instead of being your own independent uh, company. Uh, so, but I think they will get along. But it, they are like. Four years after the big papers, maybe in the digitalization, uh, <clears throat> and and you're gonna do this process pretty quickly now because the print drop is going so rapidly right now. Uh, in the last years, I think it's been increasing very very much. So you have to really jump on this train now and do it fast. Otherwise, it can be really harsh, I believe. And then I also uh, agree on that. One, one problem for us is having the right competence, having the best people wanting to be journalists in the future, uh, because they choose different <laughs> ways nowadays, and that we have to attract them in some ways. Uh, I'm not sure how. Uh, and, and then in that way, it's also hard, because many of the young people, they want to be like, be with a company that take a stand in questions. Uh, and we don't do that <laughs> and that, that is hard we have to have find those people that that are extremely good and they can say that the way i take a stand is that i don't take a stand <laughs> we're being objective and we have to like gain people and f make people think that that's something important to, uh, as well uh, yeah impartial impartiality uh, it would be also interesting to see new 
uh, businesses and new ventures from the younger side, you know, maybe in the social media platforms, but having the same classic elements of the journalism as, as, as Christian has, has been bringing up uh, during the panel. This was great. Thank you very much. Uh, it was great having you here in Helsinki, and I hope we'll, we'll have another panel, you know, in the, in the near future with you guys. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, distinguished panelists and Caius. And uh, I have the feeling that these four newspapers are in the hands of wise and brave people, so I'm optimistic also in that respect. Uh, newspapers aren't anything anyway, so uh, the next presentation is about the big digital uh, tech giants. What role do they have in uh, media landscape, in uh, democracy? in news perception. Uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers had a tech think tank, that's a difficult word, tech think tank, uh, which in April this year presented a report and we have the chair of this think tank here and I'll be happy to leave the floor to Tobias Bornake from Copenhagen. I'm happy you made it to come here to Hanna Holmen. We were expecting you online but this is much better. Thank you and welcome. Okay, so I'm a little pessimistic because uh, this is the last talk of a long day and you didn't get any break. <laughs> so, uh, so I have 40 minutes now. I'll try to make it a little interactive and ask you on the way to give some energy into the room. But uh, I hope that you also uh, try to be part of it. So my name is uh, Tobias Bonaki. Uh, I'm uh, normally working in a company called Analysis and Numbers, a research agency that measures hate speech online and disinformation and uh, polarization in the Nordic countries. And we have 33 uh, researchers working together today. Uh, today, I will be talking about what I've spent the last one and a half year uh, on, together with uh, by other people, Mina, who is here today, uh, the Nordic Think Tank for Tech and Democracy. And I still don't know why it's called a Think Tank. It's an expert committee of people from, uh, of experts from all the Nordic countries set up to uh, come out with suggestions of how to uh, regulate tech giants and their effect on the public debate. So uh, that's what we, uh, what we spent one and a half year about. We have made, uh, I think it's 11 recommendations. I'll give you some of them now. And uh, so they are right now being uh, looked at, at by the Nordic um, cultural ministers and by the Nordic uh, prime ministers. So we're really eager, looking forward to how they will respond to our suggestions. But I will start a completely different place. I will start around 70 years ago on a little town outside Olbo, where we have this small community house. And this is not a real picture from there, sadly. In this community house, my granddad is sitting and he's a gardener and he's a social democrat. And he's, all the men there are really happy and they're laughing because this happened to be the one day where the woman said, we are not cooking, so you guys have to take over. So they're all having sleeves and they don't fit in size and the thing is really fun to be cooking. But he's also debating. He was a social democrat his entire life and no other gardener was social democrats at this time. And they're having a big debate in this community house about where uh, the politics would go. So also seven years ago, we now jump to another part of Denmark a little outside a small town called Nestville, in a small, small village called Fulby. Also there, there's a community house. And in this community house, around the same time, my other granddad is there. He was a farmer. He hated social democrats. It was like a curse for him. And he's grilling with some of the other farmers. And he did that his entire life. He was always in a fight with someone. At one of the evenings, he also managed to, he was a really good dancer, and he managed to seduce my grandmother, and they were together for 80 years. We now jump into the future. We take 40 years further into the future, and we're now in a little small village called Seisweibig. I'm standing there together with my dad. I'm just a little kid, and my dad is standing with this big turkey, and he's looking really nervous. I still remember like his fear, because he's, he has a fear of birds. And he managed to win this frozen turkey in a bingo at the local community house. So he's like, he cannot get away with this turkey. 
But he's also discussing climate with one of the other guys from this little village. And this is the first time I've experienced that my dad actually disagreed with someone. Because until this point, all the people I've met, they were friends and they had the same political stance. But this guy really disagreed with my dad and thought my dad was an idiot. So they were also quilling. Today, all these three community houses are gone. This is actually the last one where my father was standing playing bingo. It has been, it's been going to be turned down next year. The other one has been turned into a kindergarten for small kids. And one place has turned into a party room where people go and have their local family parties. So one analysis of this could be that our digital democracy or democracy are falling apart. It's being torn down, literally. They used to have thousands and, and thousands of these community houses all over the Nordic countries. They're all gone now. Our work suggests something else. We have made tons of analysis of the Nordic countries, and the real result is that our democracy has become digital. In two decades, we have turned uh, local physical democracies into digital democracies with millions and millions of people participating, discussing, liking, interacting online at many, many different social services, social platforms. So in many ways, I always say to try to tell people, we always talk about the big Greek as the point in history, the point of democratic history where we really saw democracy come up but there were like a hundred people that managed to have a democracy in a little village. We have now, with 20 years, made the biggest democratic experiment in the history of mankind, where billions of people are actually trying to make a democracy work across the globe. The problem is that this new digital community ho house is not working without problems. And I've just brought one, uh, survey, there have been made tons of these, they always tell the same story all around in Nordic countries. Two out of three Danes now refrain from participating in the debate on social media. This number has been constant and slowly increasing over the time of the last 10 years. So this was the backdrop of our uh, expert committee set down. This was why we were tasked by the cultural ministers of the Nordic countries. We asked like, how do we actually make a digital democracy that works. What is it that we need? How do we, do we protect it about these big tech giants that has so much influence on how our democracy works? And I'll give you, we started out by uh, f identifying three uh, central problems that we're facing right now. The, the reasons why we believe people are refraining from participating. I'll give you an introduction from this. This is from my own research mostly because that's what I know of, but there's many other studies that follows the same line. And then I'll afterwards give you some of the ideas and suggestions that we have from the think tank for how to proceed with these things. How do we actually make uh, an experiment that works? So first, we have in all Nordic countries seen a huge amount of hate speech, or at least a lot of discussion about hate speech. So there's always this discussion, are there actually a lot of hate speech online? What do you think? Are there a lot of hate speech? Yeah. Many people have this feeling. Some people also, like my granddad before he died, he said like, yeah, it's just young, sensitive people. There's like these generations, they're messed up. So we have many discussions, and, but the general feeling is that there are a lot. So we set out uh, a few years ago to see if we could actually measure the amount of hate. And uh, just to give you an idea, now this slide is not needed anymore because now you all know what an AI is. But a few, a few years ago, this was really needed. But basically, uh, we are showing a computer how hate speech, a verbal attacks, how it looks. And we are asking, so this is two examples, you are a stupid and disgusting little loser. Damn, please push him into the harbor of radical move. So that's an example of content pulled out of Facebook. And we show 70,000 times, we showed the AI if this was a verbal attack or not. And we did this also in Sweden and Norway afterwards, so we've done it a couple of places. Based on this, we get an uh, artificial intelligence that are able to measure how much hate are actually there. We then pulled down a lot of data from the people we were seeing just before. We took all the medias in Denmark and later Norway and put it onto the database with uh, 54 million comments. 
And we did the same. We took all the parties, all the politicians, and we took all their comments too and put it into the same database. And then we had a lot of comments. And I'll come back to, uh, we had a third place, but I'll come back to that later, which were a little more uh, optimistic. So we had a lot of comments that no one could really look through because that's why no one really knows if there are hate. And we used this artificial intelligence and it gave us this number, that 5.2% of the comments on the public part of the Danish social media, Facebook, uh, were actually attacks, verbal attacks. So now I ask you, is that a lot? Why is it a lot? Mm? Good point. Other some people, I took that slide out, but some people get like the majority of this, they will get much, much more. And a lot of you people in sitting here, you don't see it. It's hidden for you. Yeah? So if you speak here for one hour, you, you say just one sentence, which is like kill the whatever minority group you choose, then it will appear it. And that's less than five minutes. Exactly. So that is the reason that that's the students I normally make pass my classes. Yes, so the argument here is that if you speak for one hour and just one sentence is, I will kill this minority, or women should not be working, they should be staying home, whatever, that's a lot. Think about that 5% is that's every 20th comment. Imagine the community hall that my granddad visited. If every 20th comment were, you're fucking something, something, or go home to your own country, could you imagine the conversation? That's why people are leaving the community house. So the second reason. So hate speech is definitely a thing. It does exist. We are able to measure it in quite a amount, big amount, especially on the open public parts of the social media. The second thing why people are leaving uh, or, or, or encountering very uh, tough uh, content is the general change of how uh, media and, and communication are changing. The information flows are generally changing. So this is how we all grew up. Some journalists were out in the field covering some news story. They went back to the editors we just had there with the story. The editors checked it through and they sent it into the, the distributed the knowledge on these different platforms. So that's how it worked. And sometimes the editor will say, oh, that doesn't sound right this story is not going in. Today we have a competing system. Today we are all content creators. We are all out with our smartphones. We are all encountering stories, some people more than others. And these have all been sent into an algorithm that then distribute these news, decides if this is interesting or not interesting. So TikTok, if a lot of people think this story is interesting, it will be come up and it will be distributed to more people. So. What is the raison d'etre of these algorithm editors? What is the most important thing driving these algorithms? I'm asking a lot of questions to keep you alive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Make, money for the Make money, or as we can also call it, no matter which of the platforms you look into, it's demand driven. And that can be a really quick and good way to build things. It can be very effective as a way of deciding what is good. If a lot of people want it, then it's probably good. So no matter if you're looking at Google or YouTube or Facebook, they're basically looking into in different ways. Is a lot of people interested in this? And if yes, then we should distribute it to more, which is very different from having a human editor look at something and saying, what is the quality of this? They are of course also looking at demand, but they will also be looking at, is this really good uh, journalistic work? So this is a good thing, I think, and, and we shouldn't be scared of it. It's, it's an add-on to our news information system. But they also have a backside. How many in here knows Rasmus Paludan? That's brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's an invention in Denmark. So he's a far-right uh, politician, quite far. Uh, but he also happens to be a Swedish citizen, so uh, when he was done making a lot of noise in Denmark, we exported him to Sweden, and uh, we've been very happy with that. 
So, uh, so this one guy who says a lot of crazy things at the election in 2019, he went on YouTube and he got a lot of attention. And we thought it would be interesting to try to measure this. How are the algorithms actually distributing news? And at this point, we were working for a lot of the big parties uh, in Denmark, so we knew they were very interested in how YouTube were working out. This was a new thing that you could make videos, so they had entire teams only focused at making really good new stuff that should be circulating. And then we measured how the election went. And Stram Kurs, which is the party of Rasmus Paludan, managed to make more shows on YouTube than the entire political established parties in Denmark. That was not the idea of our democracy, particularly not in an election. I mean, he ran, but, but a lot of the things were not about that. So, so that's just showing that is a really big problem democratically. Imagine our community house, if we, uh, the one who got the loudest voice, who was able to yell the biggest, were the one giving the mic up here. That would make our democratic, democratic system fail. So that's one problem. That's like what we call misinformation. It's something that is unintentionally, but it happens. What worries us more is that it can also be intentionally fooled. So whereas Rasmus Paladin is just really good at making YouTube movies that a lot of people watches, you can also go in and uh, attack the system. And this is one of the most convincing studies I've seen. I've actually met the researcher, he's from the US. He was very interested in looking at alternative for Deutschland during the EU election in 2019. Because he thought it was really strange that this pretty new party were able to so, get so widespread attention. And he then looked at shares at Facebook. And face, shares at Facebook is probably the biggest value you can get. It's like the highest amount of attention you can get. So the more shares you get, the further out you get, the bigger audience you get. And he got the graph to the right. And pretty much is showing that alternative for Deutschland, the blue one, is four to five times as big as the entire parties, German parties, established parties, with huge amount of funds and huge uh, communication uh, bureaus, were able to get four to five times as much as all the other parties combined. He looked at it and said, okay, they're good at an alternative for Deutschland, but it's still, that's, that's too much. It's not realistic. Then he started to look at who's sharing this, and a pattern came up. All the people that were sharing this content, they had a name with two letters, a space, and two letters. So the first person would say, hey, his name would be ME, space, TB, and the next would be SE, space, TB, and it would go on. And he could find 30, 40,000 of such people that lived in all over the world that happened to really like Alternative for Deutschland. And everything they wrote, they're just so interested in this. So we now had like 40, 30 to 40,000 people interacting with things coming out of a pretty small party that apparently had a, a really big drive. He then looked into like, what are they actually sharing? And it's difficult to see here, but all these Letters here saying something bad about immigrants um, were shared by these fake accounts. But what you can see is that they are all a little different. So social media looks after content that are alike and say that's not worth as much as unique content. So apparently Alternative for Deutschland were able to build a machine uh, that changes the image a little bit every time, changes the pixel, changes the color a little. So all the social media would believe this was unique content and push it out further. So this was a, a brilliant example, and, and the most, uh, I think the most scaring thing about this, which really made me worry about the future, was that uh, we are not, uh, Alternative Deutschland doesn't even need to agree with this. Their content can be pushed, and that's what we've seen in the recent Slovakia uh, election and the Brazil. They can get pushed no matter if they want it or not. They don't need to agree with Putin, which were probably behind this. They can simply get the back push of 40 to 50,000 profiles that will push their uh, content out. So that's the second thing that we in the expert committee looked into. We looked into how are we dealing with this tone, this hard tone online, and how are we dealing with the growing fear of disinformation targeting our democratic conversation. And finally, the last thing that we worked on the backdrop of, and I will only take one slide for that, is uh, this graph. Has anyone seen this graph before? 
it's pretty rare you in one graph can summarize an entire uh, social problem of the scale of like a society. It's showing the poor mental health in youth and uh, uh, in Denmark, but it's the same in all the Nordic countries. And I think I have never seen a mental health graph that are so steep. We are basically witnessing generations that are going, that are where, particularly for the, for the young women, but the, the men are coming after us too, are uh, becoming more and more sick without us really knowing why. And uh, there are no like clear conclusions because it's really difficult to study how this happens. And I think it's a mechanism of a lot of things, but it does fit very well with the time where uh, mobile phones and digital devices start coming out. And it does seem to kind of get another push up when we start having these reels and very short like uh, uh, adrenaline movies that keeps you in the loop. Yes. So that was the backdrop of why we set out. And now I'll give you at the end, I'll just give you some of the recommendations that we came up with. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with this because a few years ago we would have struggling just to get people to understand these problems. But our, everywhere we have been talking, giving these talks and, and meeting with politicians and media, we've been really surprised that the question is no longer if we need more democratic control. The question we meet everywhere is how this should be look like. How do we actually make a good democratic, digital democratic system? What is the uh, guidelines that we need right now to make it more healthy? Yeah. So, our first recommendation of the four that I brought. Um, we suggest that we set up a Nordic Center for Tech and Democracy. And that can seem a little weird when you have heard that the EU is actually taking care of this area. So the DSA is coming out, as has just come out. The AI Act is coming out. In many ways, we are seeing uh, the EU stepping up in this area. Why do we then need a Nordic Center? The problem is that many of these EU laws are simply not being carried through. So we had meetings with many of the people who are negotiating the EU European laws, and uh, they they are doing a really good job. And I think the laws that are coming out will, be, will look back at that and think this is like fundamentally changing how we think about social media, but what does it matter if it's not enforced? So our first recommendation was to set up a center that take care of these and uh, dig up the stories that we need to present for Brussels in order for them to carry it out. Why does it need to be Nordic? Well, we tried quite a lot to work with this in Denmark, and I won't share the experience of meeting with big tech uh, giants as a Danish representative. They're so nice to you and they just don't care. Um, so, uh, so we're done doing that in Denmark. It was fun, but I think we're moving ahead and trying something else. Uh, then you can also see at the EU, and I think that's like, I've been amazed by how willing EU have looked at this and how they're moving. There are some places where they're doing a bad job, but in general, I'm, I'm really uh, surprised. But it also takes so long time. I mean, this DSA, I think it was six or seven years it took. Okay, but in general, it's six to seven years for like a regulation to come out. And, and uh, it's just not quick enough. T think about like last year, we didn't have generative AI. Now it's everywhere. We can't have a system that works seven years behind. So we, we believe that we should try to center, to try to pull together in the Nordic countries. We have very much the same democratic stories. We have the same democratic beliefs of like a good democracy. So, and we have a size where some people actually might listen to us. These centers should have different specializations. And one of the specializations should work with children. And here we came in with like two uh, recommendations that have uh, been taken up by the, oh, I forgot to say, the Danish government is right now setting up a Nordic, uh, Danish center for tech and democracy. So we're very happy with this recommendations coming through in Denmark. Um, another thing that the Danish government is also trying to implement is that we came up with two recommendations for children. The first was to make a demand of age verification. And I really like, it. I don't know what the laws are in your country, but in my country, uh, when I was young, they made these changes that we're actually able to buy beer. That you had to be, I think, 13 to actually buy beers. We were really against because we thought it was like unnecessary in any way. 
And that has also been the reaction to this. Of course, a lot of young people are like, why do we need age verification? But in many ways, I think we have age verification in so many places in our society. We have so many things that we are not allowing young people to attend. And we should also do it with some of these areas. Right now, a lot of the Czech giants are getting away with a lot of things by saying we don't have young people on our platforms. TikTok, I've, I've met with them a couple of times, and they always say we have no one underneath 13. And that must be with one exception, because my young data, data 10 is attending at least. But of course, they have so many. And they're hiding between this fact that they're saying we don't have any young people, so don't need to take care of them. We believe firmly that we should make an age verification, because then we can start also putting content on these platforms based on the age. So a 13-year-old doesn't get the same as an 18-year-old. We also suggest that we have these parental mechanisms that all the tech giants are developing right now. They're just hiding out one little fact. So they put on a, a parental mechanism saying, uh, you, if you turn this on, your kid can only be on one hour. Can you imagine how many parents actually go in and turn on that thing? It's so few. I, I don't think I ever met anyone who does it because it's like it's hidden somewhere inside the system. And the thing is, we need to change the perspective and have a broader focus where this default is that, of course, you protect kids. If you know an uh, account belongs to a kid, you should also have these default mechanisms on. And if you then want your kid to have at least four hours of TikTok every day, you should be able to go in and click it off. But that's a shift in like perspective. Our third recommendation uh, and I will take this from Brazil, where there recently was a, a, a big election. I think many of you probably followed it. There were also, just as there have been to the other elections, a lot of disinformation spreading from both sides. So both sides in Brazil are really good at making these campaigns of, of fake news. Uh, the, the one change there were this time, however, is that when the, the researchers investigating on uh, Twitter and were able to find disinformation campaigns, uh, they submitted it and they got a reply from an email that this person doesn't exist any longer because Elon Musk had fired the entire team taking care of Brazil. And I think for me it illustrates that we cannot rely on uh, individual uh, tech giants' willingness to help us out with these things. One, thing, one area where we particularly cannot rely on their willingness to help us if they want to but have to force them is their uh, willingness to provide researchers and alike with data about the problems that we see. So all the research that I have shown you today were only possible because we were able to get access to data. And the last many years, the, the uh, tech giants have been closing down this access because they're slowly learning that every time they give data to me, I'll come back with a critical report. And it's just easier not giving out data. So uh, the EU, of course, disagreed with it and made a law, the DSA. The part of the law is that they have to hand out data on certain areas, freedom of speech, uh, disinformation, children's safety. These areas, researchers should be able to ask for data to get it. Our third recommendation is to set up an office that uh, helps out researchers getting this data because we don't think they will give it up willingness. And we should not have like individual researchers to to apply for it. I'm nearing the end. Are you still there? OK. Thank you. So uh, my last two recommendations. The fourth recommendation is uh, a more uh, long term. So now I've shown things that can actually be done quite quickly. And the Danish uh, state, at least, are looking into implementing all these uh, in the near future. Um, the fourth is, is kind of a change in perspective. So we all have civil societies, and in Nordic countries, we have a long tradition for supporting this. So if you have a civil society actor in, in my little municipality, you can actually apply to get a, a room where you can meet, or you can get a little support if you have young people in your group. But we don't have any support for the digital volunteers. We are right now making a mapping of the digital volunteers. All the people that are running, uh, uh, the people who like horses group, or the group for young women, or the channel for us who live in Swinborg, or the channel for us who live in Swinborg who like dirty language. All these groups, we have in Denmark, uh, our estimate right now, and this hasn't come out, the research is that there are 50,000, uh, 500,000 Danes 
who are in some way responsible for running online forums of this kind. That's an amazing number. And I think that digital volunteers should be like a new area where we focus, you know, the state's focus, to build up civil society. In many ways, they are running uh, what we know as associations and what we have all known from our, of our real uh, common civil society work. It just happens to be digital instead. And we should make infrastructure that supports these people in handling hate speech and protecting their work and, uh, yeah. Finally, uh, my last recommendation. Uh, a topic today has been generative AI. And I have to say, I, I love generative AI. I'm using it when I code. I'm using it to write emails. But especially, uh, particularly in the democratic perspective, it has some really dangerous uh, backsides. So all the people you see on the left are fake uh, people that don't exist. You go to the page called uh, thispersondoesexist.com and they will come up with an image like this. A few months, uh, two months ago, this paper on the right came out. It's the first paper, the first research group that were able to find a bot network, like thousands of fake profiles driven by computers, spreading disinformation, but driven by generative AI. It's the first time we've been able to find one of these networks. The scary thing is not this network particularly. The scary thing is that when the researchers found it, the article is actually about testing. Could we have found this network if we didn't stumble upon it? So they found this network by coincidence because they, they made a coding error. So they actually showed that they were a bot. And the researchers took it down and said, OK, what, what, would we be able to use any of the tools that we've used for the last 10 years to detect this information? Could we use any of these tools for this? The answer is, no, we could not. And that was also what we expected. We cannot see these networks. So the huge networks that exist today and that we have been fighting, many of us, for many years, that's what I do in my everyday work, we cannot see them anymore. And I think uh, it cannot be stressed enough how big a change this is to our information ecosystem. I really love the way Carl said it earlier, that we, when, when this hits, when this becomes big and all the bot networks become uh, uh, driven by generative AI, I fear that there will be, uh, and this is from a movie, uh, it's a bad movie, but, but the image is really good, this, uh, it's a dystopian where the live, uh, the, the human live the few places where the water is not taking over. And this is what I imagine the information system in the future. Small areas where we actually can get trustful knowledge and we go to these places and live there. And then sometimes you go out into the internet, into the wild, and the amount of synthetic data out there, the amount of things that you might, might be true, might not, will be huge. In the, in the think tank, we didn't have the solution for this. We have some really concrete solutions, but we also think it's a little premature to come up with it. So our recommendation is that we set down a task force that will follow this development and see how different elections uh, proceed and to what degree these, um, these attacks are becoming more intense. And with that said, that was what I brought. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tobias. Thank you so much, Tobias. And um, as Tobias was the last speaker to be on site today, I suggest instead of a break that we give all the speakers a standing ovation, which gives us some power. <laughs> We will, have, we will have possibility of discussions, but we have asked for one comment by Jukka Vahti of the Finnish Innovation Fund, Citra, who is uh, uh, covering, recovering from a COVID infection at home. So I hope that we can have Jukka on the screen, and we hope that he will hear us. Let's see. And after that, we can uh, have a discussion. Jukka has promised to give us a short comment and also uh, describe a little from his perspective what he's working with. And now I can see you, Jukka. Do you hear me? And do we hear yes. you? Yes. Yes, we hear you. So the screen is yours for a while. Thank you. Uh, 
and thanks for the invitation. And uh, I'm very sorry I can't be there, but I'm uh, at home for the fifth day in a row and and uh, slowly recovering from my personal second round of COVID and still can't recommend it to anyone, but getting better. Not quite there yet, so I will, I will try to uh, make myself clear and keep this short. Um, thank you all for excellent presentations. I've been able to listen to some of them, not all of them. Uh, I prepared a couple of slides. This is uh, the most uh, exciting moment always to see if the slides can be shared. Let's see. Here we go. Yes, I think it's working. Uh, thank you, Tobias, for an excellent presentation. Uh, I prepared my uh, short comment uh, as a comment to Tobias's um, presentation, but uh, I also have a few uh, general observations on, on the topic. Um, my name is Jukka Vahti. I work at Citra as a project director for a project called Digital Power and Democracy, where we, we aim to... Um, <laughs> increase understanding of the relations between digitalization and democracy, and also uh, on uh, increase understanding on this rapidly changing media and information environment. And um, to sum up the day so far, I think much of the talks that I've been able to follow today have been about the ability of an individual to know what's true and what's not, and what's going on in the world around us. And I think this is really one of the core questions when it comes to the future of democracy, uh, because our liberal democracies have relied on this idea of the informed democratic citizen who has the capaci capacity to decide who he or she wants to vote, uh, who has the ability to know what's true and what's not, and to form uh, his or her own opinions. And as we've heard in many of the talks today, this might not be the case anymore. Uh, when it comes to our hybrid media environment, it can be said that we are not, at least uh, for the big part, we are not in the shared reality anymore. And I think this is really dangerous and something that should be taken even more seriously than it has been taken so far. Because if we perceive our societies and especially our democracies as a uh, very complex systems designed to process information, process different kinds of opinions, process different feelings and uh, perspectives, and then kind of produce politics, decisions, budgets, that aim to make our societies better and our everyday lives better. This all can't happen if we need to give up this ideal of informed citizen as the core of this system. And I think all of this underlines the fact that we can no longer look at democracy and digitalization as separate fields of expertise or um, different silos of government uh, or separate realities. I think these worlds are phenomena intertwined and they should be addressed together. And I think that Tob Tobias's uh, keynote made this very clear and in an elaborate way. Just a couple of comments on, on why we should have more cooperation between Nordic countries when it comes to these phenomena. Uh, I think we all know that the United States, China, and the European Union are kind of the global power centers when it comes to, for, uh, to the battle of uh, fights over digital power and who gets to set the rules on how artificial intelligence is developed and used. And all this is becoming more and more important part of geopolitics in general. Um, Citrus megatrends have identified the global disputes and tensions of the direction of technological development, as well as the accumulation of digital power and how it affects our societies and 
what are the best means of protecting citizens and fair market environment. And this is all happening intertwined uh, with another mega trend that's the decline of democracies uh, space, the decline of democracy globally. Uh, and in this context, it would, of course, make very much sense for the Nordic countries to collaborate or at least coordinate efforts on how to react to these global developments. And just to add one perspective to this, if you consider the amount of money and resources, the billions of euros used by authoritarian regimes annually to create disinformation aiming to deteriorate the basis of democracies uh, or to deteriorate our trust or, or our trust in fundamental human rights, I think it's really important to ask whether us as democratic societies have invested enough in defending democracy in comparison to the huge investments made in trying to destroy democracies, basically. So I think that's a very fundamental question that has not been addressed enough so far. Um, another recommendation that Tobias made in his uh, presentation was putting children first. And I totally agree with that. I'd put children first too, but maybe I'd written the perspective to, uh, to uh, young and the young adults too, because I think that democracies can't really survive if the new generations don't feel that they have a place in it, if they don't acknowledge democracy as their own or don't perceive it as worth defending. And I think this somehow correlates with, with the observation that in many countries there's been a growing concern about uh, uh, the passivism of the younger generations, that they are not interested in voting or taking part in society. And at the same time, however, we have witnessed global movements often led by the young people on issues like climate change, social justice, inclusion, diversity, and more. So I don't think that the passivity of young people is the core problem. I think the problem is that we need to find new ways to kind of channel uh, the will and skills of young people to participate and not just participate, but to influence uh, in the direction that our societies are going. And one part of the problem are the social media platforms, in my opinion, because they don't really uh, consider individual people as citizens, but as customers, and they treat you that way. And they are designed to grasp your attention. They are designed to grasp your data and then use that to target ads, as we all know. So I think this underlines the need for alternative platforms and digital environments that, that are designed for democratic purposes. Uh, Tobias also talked about data and how we should have better means in gaining access to data that these mega platforms are gathering. And I couldn't agree more that researchers should have better access to data. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's essential that this should also be on the agenda of politicians and media, for example, for them to be able to understand how this invisible world, how these ecosystems of data work and how, how it affects our everyday life. Uh, many of you know our DG Power investigation that's shown on this slide. I won't go too deep into that. We've talked about it. I think we've talked about it a year ago in this same event, but it was one attempt to make this invisible a world of data gathering and using ecosystems visible, but a lot more work needs to be done, both in understanding how these mechanisms work and also to, to understand their societal meaning. 
And we need more societal debate on who controls all that data, what are they doing with it, and by what authority. And and uh, this is really important because I think that understanding digital power, as we call it, that's our attempt to bring digital together with democracy, digital power as a concept. I think understanding digital power is about understanding the connections between democracy, technology, and data economy. And it also points out that it's not just about democracy and it's not just about data economy in itself. We need these things to develop into right direction, hand in hand, because I don't think that we can have sustainable digital democracy if we don't have more transparent and fair data economy in the future. So I know it's been a long day. I will finish in a second. Uh, one recommendation that Tobias presented uh, was a Nordic task force that, that, that could understand better how AI is being used in generating this information. This too is an excellent idea. Uh, uh, and I think that we should also create other kinds of ways, not just to monitor, but also to create ways for people to participate in how AI services are developed, uh, how they work, and also to have a say in how the rules they play by are formed. So in a way, I think, I don't know how exactly, but I think it would be crucial to see technological developments like artificial intelligence as something that doesn't just appear to us and then we take it or leave it, but as something that's done by people and companies and that should be somehow controlled by democratic institutions and the people who are affected by them. So that's why I think that we need more democracy in tech as well as we need more tech in democracy, in defending and renewing democracy. And it's not an easy task, task to do, but it's also a matter of perspective. And uh, one thing that we are currently investigating at Citra is the possibilities of civic tech or dem tech uh, to renew democracy and to support uh, defending democracy. And civic tech is this kind of an umbrella term for a range of digital services that enable citizens to participate directly in, for example, decision-making processes. But I think they could be used in uh, participating people in many other things too than just the institutional decision-making processes. For example, how AI-based public services are developed. That would be really an interesting thing and that's something that we are currently looking at, at Cedra. Uh, and I think that DemTech, for its part, could help us build better architectures of democratic participation. And by architecture, I mean the society or democracy as a whole, because we usually tend to look at one piece at a time. We look at institutions, for example, parliament, whether the processes of legislation are transparent and whether people have uh, possibilities to have a say in them. Or we look at the citizens, whether they are informed, whether they have media or information literacy. And then we try to create new means for participation. But I think we need all these three things. We need transparent institutions, we need new forms of participations, and citizens who are willing and able to participate. And these things need to work together. So that's why I call it architecture. It's We can't have one without the other for the things to work. Um, and that's one reason why at Citra we develop, we test, we fund uh, new forms of participation, new technological uh, solutions, as well as we cooperate with these institutions uh, for them to be able to renew their processes and their operating models. And one final point, then I'll quit. All of this kind of 
brings us to money. Uh, new inventions in civic tech or or new inventions in trying to make our media environment healthier will not be achieved without investment. And what's needed now is for policymakers, for example, to have the courage to invest and experiment and to make room for experimentation uh, and to ensure adequate resources to exploit new technologies that could support and renew democracy. Uh, and when it, where it all comes down to is that democracy in itself should be perceived as a strategic asset for Nordic countries and also as a fundamental part of our security politics in these geopolitically unstable times. It should be seen as at the core of what we are aiming to defend. It's not an easy task, but it must be done. And that's that's kind of my final remark. Thank you very much for having me. And and uh, now I suppose we will have discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jukka. And also thank you for providing what we are waiting for after this discussion. Can I please ask Tobias Bornake and uh, Minna Aslama to come here to uh, take part in the short discussion which we will have now and uh, after that we will enjoy the so-called democracy drinks which normally are purchased by uh, purchased by, by everybody but today they are provided by Citra we have uh, something to serve after this uh, I am sure there are questions about Borna, uh, Tobias Bornakes presentation and uh, I'm happy to open the the discussion I have a colleague with a microphone over there in order to let the viewers of the stream also hear what we are talking about. Uh, waiting for the first, first hand to be raised, I'd like to pose, or you had, a f oh, several hands. Good, thank you. We're still Please. awake, that's great. Um, hi everyone, my name is Elina Saniolikainen. I'm a PhD researcher at Obo Academy at the Institute for Human Rights. And thank you, Tobias, for your presentation. I really enjoyed the storytelling part that you started with. And um, so I would like to hear from you. Um, when you presented these recommendations, so what is the story that we can tell after a couple of years when these recommendations have been put into place? <laughs> what do you think will happen? Take the microphone, please. Oh, yeah, me, not me. Okay. Yes. Um, so, so I have to admit, I didn't expect to get very many of these things through because working in tech, it's, it's not like the most uh, interesting thing for many people. I mean, to get the politicians' attention for this can be a little difficult. But things have really changed, at least uh, in Denmark, but I've now visited other countries too. It's, it's, it is changing. People are understanding that tech is half of our life, and therefore we should also use quite a lot of uh, politi political power. So we've been really surprised that a lot of our recommendations are coming through. Um, I'm seeing them as... Uh, so. Now I'm telling a little behind the curtain. In Denmark, they set down another expert committee at the same time. It just happened that they also set down a tech committee, a Danish committee. And we kind of split up and we said that we would focus on the here and now changes and they would focus on the long changes, which is also what Yuka is coming into uh, before in his talk, like who owns data? How do we look, how do we get access to AI? How do we know, how do we get transparency? All these like big discussions that are the most important. I see our role as committing like the small steering right here and now where you would small changes. None of these things is are really big. That's why we're also getting them through uh, can change a lot. So I don't think we will change society, but I think that we will at least change the course a bit on, on some important areas. Can I add? No, I, I was he was my boss uh, in the think tank. I think what we did there, and I think also what all the discussions today and also the research we did for Nordis about for Nordic countries and audio, media audiences, the story is that we are a Nordic region. We truly share common values. We truly share similar problems. We can share the solutions. And I think this is a big, big story in this globalized world where power is a tripod uh, China, US and the EU and we can have a say like that and I think that's the biggest story and it was so inspiring. So just to give an, an example of how different we are, 
it's just a story from my life. We were studying social media data from all the Nordic countries. And then we also studied Germany once. And we thought our collector, data collector, were broken. Because data looks so different, and there was so little of it. It happens, we had a, a, in a, a person working for us that was from Germany, and he said, no, 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 we used to live with the KGB. Of course we don't leave any data anywhere. So it's just our perspective of democracy, our perspective of freedom of speech is different, but it's very much alike in Nordic countries. There we can't see any differences. We had one question over there, and then Mikko Salo over there. Hi everyone. Um, hey Alla, jätte fint att vara här. I'm Joy Huvarinen. Um, I'm a member of the board of the Freedom of Expression organization, Finnish Pen. Small organization, very big voice because our members include some of the leading writers and journalists in, in, in Finland. We're very interested in uh, the link between uh, national security and freedom of expression and, and with democracy as, at, at its core. Uh, we hosted a workshop uh, a couple of months ago. The report is available on our website in three languages. I'd be really interested in hearing a few more, more comments about that because, of course, uh, Finland's and uh, the Nordic countries' uh, security context has changed hugely, very abruptly, and that change is continuing. And that includes foreign bad actors targeting democracy and trying to undermine it in various ways. And that's where things like disinformation, which I sort of avoid um, using these days because often um, uh, information does not need to be incorrect to be used in a very manipulative and hostile way. And also uh, hateful speech. I tend to avoid hate speech because that's um, uh, a concept that people have very, people interpret in very different ways. There's no uh, agreed definition. I think those two things, uh, disinformation, incorrect information, hateful speech, um, come up very much um, in this context because they are part of driving divisions in society and deepening divisions and undermining democracy. I think that's something that should be a really major concern in the Nordic countries and in Finland, where we've seen examples, people may think that they are defending freedom of expression, but in practice, they're actually playing uh, according to what a foreign bad, they're dancing to the tune of a foreign bad, bad ac actor and achieving something <coughs> completely different. So I'd just be interested in hearing a few more comments about, about that and concrete national security risks. Um. So, so I think your your point is very uh, interesting. Uh, personally, I, I think we have been through a period where first we we found out that the so social media the tech giants should not be deciding who moderated what, because that's really dangerous. And now we've been finding out that maybe the state should not neither, even though it's from security perspective can make sense. So I think we need to develop, and, and that's another project I'm move, working on right now, is like how can we distribute moderation to all the different small actors. How can we get, I talked about the 500,000 digital volunteers. How can we make them the ones to decide what is moderated and not moderated? And it's just an example of how I think that we protect ourselves the best. It's kind of like pushing out power in this system. It's been like uh, consolidating. Um, yeah. I believe Although I'm not a, not a security expert, but I do believe that what we have as an advantage in the Nordic countries is our robust national media systems. And I think it's, it's a wonderful tool for national security, um, as well as developing uh, practices and support for other independent actors, such as fact checkers, who are an, who are an addition, additional tool. But to me, it starts with the, the strong national media system, which then enhances the trust in the knowledge institutions and then, then those other institutions that protect our national security. That's what I think, as a, as a lay person. 
Mikko Salo of Faktabari. Thank you, Mikko Salo of Faktabari, and I'm actually a member of the Nordis and one of the founders to Nordis and actually trying to uh, representing Nordis towards the kind of preventive actions towards European elections. So what is really coming next? And so following very closely. I'm also an international relations major for my background and I just, everything that I've observed 10 years ago, this is primarily a tech problem. The technology has been weaponized by authoritarian regimes. So, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a tricky tricky part to this one. And now it's of course a kind of arms race going on with, uh, with one who is, who is doing what, because it's a, it's a really serious situation. And then we are going, is two thirds of the world population, democratic countries are voting next year. So this is the, the ugly context. So my, my question to you will be, what next? Because we are in, in, a, in a, some sort of urgency. Nordis is doing things, you have been doing Tobias a lot so please go for that one. But, uh, and I think the only momentum now is the cooperation, enhance what you have already, and then to seize the moment of the generative AI, because this is the big thing. It was touched by the journalists, but I mean, this was still very timid. In tech circles, this has been around for ages already, AI. Now it just became with a chat GPT to our mobile phones. So now we are all like, oh wow, is wonderful. It's, it's scary. It's scary, but it's it's like uh, we know this type of thing. So, so but more. It's more like a what next. And and personally, I would really urge, having heard about Gus and all that, also the journalistic forces to pull up their resources for the Norway, that is really going further and proposing solutions independent to the to the tech com tech companies, because the rest are mostly following at the moment. But I mean, wonderful initiatives, what we have from you, what, what's next? Thank you. Yeah, so, so when you give these speeches, you can get the, I, I learned this new word called al alarmist, an alarmist person like seems very depressed yeah. and fear everything. And I don't, I didn't used to be that. I just have to say like, I, I've been working with disinformation for many years. I think it's way out of proportion how fearful we have been for it. Uh, but but uh, to come back to your question before about security and and the thing is, I, I I've tried to give people this picture uh, that that we have been fighting a disinformation battle with some people from Saint Petersburg, and it's been done with these like old front-loaded guns. So it took like a long time for them to make a campaign, and they took up this gun and they shoot at us, and and we will be some of the people monitoring the uh, the social media and the Nordics, and here we can we will get up our gun and we load it and we shoot back. And suddenly we, we are seeing an, an, an enemy now that have automated these things. In many ways, like a machine gun. So the amount that we are looking into is just so terrifying. But there are solutions to this. It's not like a solution, but, but they, they, I think it's not like very difficult solutions. It's things where we have to give up on our uh, other values. And this is the dangerous part. That's why, to be honest, the, the reason why we recommend to sit down a task force to look at this is that we don't think any society is ready to give up these things for the moment because we haven't seen the attacks. But at some point, we'll have to, to, uh, to consider that you have to validate to get on a social media platform, that you are not allowed to make a uh, account uh, without having a sign-in of uh, governmental papers or something really big. That has huge like privacy issues. It's a huge problem in countries like Hungary where you don't want the state to have these uh, data on you. There's so many backsides of this, but I don't see a future where we don't like move into some of these things. So the next phase for me, I expect is that we, we, we will see these attacks. We will see them next year. We'll see some uh, serious problems in democracies that are already having problems. And then it will start a discussion. How far are we willing to go to defend our democracy? And I don't have the answers for that. That's why I want a task force to deal with that problem. Yeah, and I, I hate to get back to the national media systems, but there is a, <laughs> for instance, there's a big um, survey study called um, the state of uh, state media, and it just shows how independent media in this world is a very, uh, you know, it's, it, it's uh, shrinking year by year. When you look at editorial freedom, governance, and funding models. And in collaboration, you know, in, in, in addition to what, what Tobias just said, I think we have to look into that and take that seriously as well. We know, as, as you said, Gaius, fake news laws are used against uh, dissidents, for instance. So that's not the solution. 
literacy, of course. But what we haven't really talked about here and when, when we recommended the sort of task force on AI is also the sort of inbuilt discrimination that, that is included in that. And so I guess in the future, when we are looking at disinformation, we have to also think about other types of risks that have to do with AI, and that's why, again, referring to Yuka's um, point, we need participation in, in uh, decision making of wh what we're doing with it, the AI. For instance, in Finland, it's in the government program, but during the uh, or prior to the our parliamentary elections, we really didn't hear, hear any discussions about how AI is going to be used in public sector uh, or very little. We don't know really how different parties stand on that and so on and so forth. So, uh, yes, important. Yes, future is important, but it goes even beyond disinformation, in my opinion. And that's why we need the task force, so we can think about Nordic values. Thank you. Do you have a short, a short very addition? Short, very short. I would hate myself if I wouldn't say that this is super important. I was 2018, before the last European elections, a European-wide roundtable with, uh, with um, all the platforms and everybody and all that. And this is, that's the level where the regulations is made. Nobody is listening Denmark, nobody is listening Finland, the big tech companies. They are listening only the European level at the moment. I think it's wonderful if we can enforce them together in our system because that's common system. But the Nordic countries have not been very united or cooperating on that type of things, at least yet. So it's a wonderful thing. And of course, this legislation has to be implemented. This is going to be implemented from 17th of February. The DSA should be implemented. And we hardly know anything. How many of you do know the DSA coordinator in your countries? That's, that's going to happen now, but I mean, nobody, I mean, we are, we are let's say, following that one. <laughs> but, but, but that's the thing. So if it doesn't work out, people don't raise. And of course, then everything that can be done within the remit, I mean, EU is not going to say anything about the media. So I mean, protecting some of the media. But Nordic media houses are not yet in the stage that need, let's say, that level of protection. So it's more like taking care of themselves. Literacy, all the education thing, EU is not going to kind of help us. I mean, we have to do that type of things ourselves. So, but the, the policy policy, and that's what I love with the initiative, that it puts it in, in the European framework, but still tries to find the, let's say, the context. And, and good luck with that one. Thank you. Thank you, Mikko. And um, thank you for, for the discussion. I will pose the last question myself. Uh, I heard Tobias said, that uh, there is no use talking with the big tech companies. They just smile and say something nice. And we have the same experience here at Tannaholm, and we have tried to have them here discussing these matters, and they always are very, very helpful and, and nice and, and have um, nothing to come to, to serve and, and, and present. Uh, is there any hope of uh, them wanting to cooperate? Yes, so, so that's something I thought a lot about, because when you get appointed as uh, the chair of this, uh, you suddenly get all these appointments with uh, European leaders of Apple and like all these people flying in who want to talk with you, which was amazing, except they're only tech giants. So you had all these people that... Uh, so I, get a, I got a chance to talk with more or less the, the leaders of all the, the, the tech giants. Uh, and and my, my understanding afterwards was that these people are actually not from the company. And we have to learn that in Denmark it's even more clear. It's actually a PR company that they have hired to represent, for example, Facebook. It's, so they're not working in Facebook. They're just people hired. So we have to look. So I'm just giving a tip to anyone who wanted. Uh, I talked with some guy who was like negotiating on this very high European level. And he said, you have to insist to meet the people behind these people. That's actually where you can do things. And these people are, many of them are very intelligent and very nice. And you can actually affect them because they're working in the company. But they have kind of set up a shield that we are all talking with someone from Facebook that are actually not working at Facebook. So that was, that was my, maybe that's a good ending for today. There's yes. a lot of hope. That tells something about the media landscape today. Thank you very much, Tobias and Minna. Thank you all. <laughs> and a special, a special thank to Eric, our technical supervisor, who made everything so smooth today. And before we leave, I will be happy to uh, introduce one of our partners, the Anders Foundation Chair Björn Wikström, who will 
say the final remarks. And uh, for all of you, I hope that you will enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Henrik. And I'm sad to say I have, I have no more medals to grant anybody today. <laughs> But uh, I'm very grateful for this seminar, which is the result of a very creative and inspired cooperation. And uh, thanks to all of you for being here, for participating and, and for, for sharing your, your, your knowledge and your experiences. Uh, but what comes after that? I was given the title, My Responsibilities as a Citizen. Uh, when you have the opportunity to, to listen to, to such interesting and thought-provoking presentations and discussions as we have had today, the natural consequence is to ask yourself, what should I do with this information? What should I do as a professional in my work life? And what should I do as a citizen? Considering the ambiguity and the vast uh, multi-dimensional media la landscape, the pessimistic answer would be, you cannot do very much, at least not as an individual. Such a pessimism would, however, be devastating, not only for our common future, but also for our understanding of ourselves as moral agents. To say to another human being or to oneself that what you say and what you do is totally insignificant is equivalent to saying your life does not really have a meaning, at least not outside your immediate social network. I think that one of our responsibilities as citizens is to contribute to the common good of our society. In relation to the questions we have been discussing today, this means among other things to take responsibility for how we handle information, what posts we share, what truths we take for granted, and what facts or so-called facts we call into question. It's often claimed that everyone can be a provider of content in the modern media landscape. It's been said also here today. And even though th this might be a truth in need of certain modifications, uh, it still is based on an important emphasis. We are not simply passive receivers of information. We are instead active agents in networks where information, news and interpretations are shared, assessed and transmitted. We cannot just wait for someone to come and educate us in media literacy. We need to pursue media skills actively, but then we need also guidelines to follow. Uh, in the same sense as we cannot outsource our responsibilities regarding people we meet or regarding the climate change or the, the environment, we should not either outsource our responsibilities as active players in the media landscape. A functioning democracy requires freedom of speech expression, but it requires also citizens who are willing to fulfill their role as responsible, critical and creative actors in the interchange of information and news. Tobias was a little bit critical about the, 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 uh, the expression think tank, but I think we have got a lot to think about today. Thanks for that. <laughs>